here. Congratulations uh, for, for being a finalist. Uh, we, we look forward to this evening and being able to talk with you. Uh, just to, uh, we had originally scheduled these for 75 minutes. We went 90 minutes last night, so we'd like to offer you the same. Uh, we do have about, I think, a dozen questions, so and some of them are long, so you, you might want to be mindful of, you know, so that we can get through all of them. Of, of, uh, and we'll, we'll keep you up to date on the time. So if you have an opening statement, and then we'll jump into the questions. And thank you. So we've spoken a few times now in various different contexts. So I'll try to keep it short. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to um, speak to all of you and all of the work that you've done in terms of planning for this process. I know you've been in interviews all day for me and then obviously for the other candidates. And you clearly put a lot of thought into this. And I think that represents, for me, the reason I'm interested in this job. Reading is clearly a community that cares about its students, about the diligence around having good and excellent schools. And you've demonstrated that in the due diligence you've put into this process. Um, as you know, I'm the uh, high school principal at Arlington High School. I've been there for eight years. I have loved the time there. Um, I have had the good fortune to have a very strong team and set of colleagues. And we've currently are in the process of building a pro building that I'm very excited about building. But the opportunity to take the helm of a district like Reading doesn't come along very often. Um, Reading, to some extent, feels like uh, a, an extension, not an extension, but I've been a part of the Middlesex League. And as a Middlesex League neighbor, it's the kind of community that I'd really like to take a leadership role in. My wife briefly worked here. Half of my staff, I think, lives in Reading. And so we often feel like we're neighbors and, and colleagues. So um, I'm really excited to hear the questions that you have to ask. And, Hopefully, to make my case for why um, I'm the best choice for the job. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom, Tom Wise. Thank you again, <coughs> Dr. Jenger, for uh, joining us this evening and for all the coordination of today and everything else we, we've been going through. So, very much appreciate it. Uh, my, my question is the first one, which is uh, a little bit of building on your opening statement there. It says, What appeals to you specifically about coming to work for Reading Public Schools? What are some of what are some areas where you see a need for change or that you would like to build upon? Further, how do you see your particular skill sets working effectively for us, and why do your skill sets match our needs? So as I've talked to folks in the last few days and as I've just generally known about the community, again, the thing that really attracts me to Reading is that this is a community that is committed to educating all of its children and the whole child, right? So they're not simply bragging about the great teams or wonderful performing arts or good academic outcomes, but also the work that people are doing to make sure that all of the students feel supported and that they're growing as whole people, not just academically, but in terms of social, emotional, um, and, and personal interactions. And that's the kind of educational environment that I want to create and the kind of an educational environment that I want to become part of. Um, in terms of challenges, I don't think Reading's challenges are unique to Reading. Um, you know, in many cases, I'd go around and say, yep, I recognize that issue and I recognize that issue. You know, we are going through a time of transition in the Boston area. Communities are shifting. So communities like Reading, one of the things that makes them so powerful is that people moved here and have a real sense of community and many folks have lived here for a long time and then other folks see that kind of a community and they want to be part of it. I know that's the way I felt about Arlington. Um, and at the same time as those folks come in, they create change in those communities. Um, and so we create this tension that some of the things that have brought us to those communities also then change the communities. And so one of the real strengths I think I have had is, is navigating the way in which that conversation about diversity and change really can enrich the community without losing the things that we're really committed to. I think public schools have at their heart the ability to convene communities and neighborhoods. So a long time ago, I did educational research and traveled all over the country. And one of the things I loved was you'd go to a different state and then you'd go to a community 
and then you go to the heart of that community, which was the school. Um, it was the best way to travel ever, even though many of those schools were in very challenging communities, because you really got to see and understand the things that were important to people, because nothing is more important to communities than their children. Um, I, in terms of change, a lot of the time communities like this have a great strength around advocacy. People that I spoke to care deeply about children. Um, and that is the sort of place you want to come work because people who care about children and are working as advocates for children, that's not an easy thing to create. Um, but often in that case, you have challenges around process. And some of the things, the questions I heard were sort of how do we organize so that we're all working in the same direction? Because in the throes of that advocacy, people work at cross purposes and politics and conflict kind of bubble up about that because people care deeply about what it is they're doing. And I, I have found <coughs> sort of my strength and part of why I like to do this is I love building collaborative teams and then I love being part of those collaborative teams. Um, you know, and what I've seen in the schools that I've worked in is that I get these, you get people working together and also understanding where they differ but drawing on each other's differences in professional and effective ways and that really enlivens the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the uh, next question is uh, Carla Nazaro. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for coming today and thank you for organizing um, our, our site visit today. Um, decision making is a two-edged sword. Some situations call for decisiveness right at the start, while others involved consensus building. Can you please tell us about a situation where you d were decisive and how it worked out for you? And would you please tell us about a time when you were not decisive enough and what you learned from it? Okay. People ask very specific questions like that. You're like, oh, do I have a good example of that thing? So the distinction that you made is one that I often talk about, actually, usually review that with my staff periodically in terms of the way we make decisions. Um, so on the one hand, I like what you said, they have areas where there needs to be decisiveness um, and where you often won't get agreement. Those kinds of conversations, things like schedules, for example, right, logistics around activities, what I've always done is taken as much feedback as I can given the amount of time that we have and then I make the best decision that I can. Um, when I can, I float it out to the community to say, did I miss something that's gonna make this a problem? Um, and I'll give an example just most recently. Um, with our new schedule, we had to shift, we, the students have had a lot of free time on Wednesdays, <coughs> and staff had a lot of free time on Wednesdays, and they really valued that. Um, when we reviewed all of the other programming, one of the challenges we had was that we needed to create a gap in the middle of the day for students to transition. Um, and in order to create that gap in the middle of the day for students to transition, the only effective thing we could figure out to do was to move that free time to the middle of the day and have some more class time on Wednesday mornings. I think I got a, so we went around to every teaching department to say, like, this is not a choice. We're going to do this unless you can tell me a reason why school won't work, right? Unless there's a, a something that we've missed in this. And the teachers understood, right? And the teachers were like, we don't like this. We like what we had before. Um, we said, well, equity is going to trump your preferences, right? And then we got a petition from a, you know, the students sent me a petition with 500 signatures. I haven't seen who the signatures are, so I don't know where they were, but there were 500 signatures on there um, because they would like to keep their Wednesday mornings. Now we switched that same time. They still have a break in the middle of the day, which I think they may find um, is they make better use of than the time in the mornings. Um, but the conversation with them, again, was to explain why we were doing it as we were doing. We had a number of class meetings, and it was one of the topics. I wrote the letter to the students um, and explained that, in the end, we understand your preferences. We understand the reasons you want to do that. We're trying to balance out those concerns. But your preferences don't trump other students' ability and need to access school. Right? We're going to have to make that kind of balance. So that's the way you make that kind of decision. The other end of the spectrum um, are it's conversations about how you teach. Um, and I think I've talked about this before. Those require buy-in, understanding, you know, the implementation.
education of collaborative problem solving which is something that we are now very committed to in arlington high school um, that was a four year process because uh, one of the things we did each year was to survey student teachers at the beginning and the end of the year and there's three scales that mgh provides one is how burnt out are they um, second is do they understand the philosophy and third do they buy into the philosophy and the idea being that you can't implement a change if everybody's burnt out right and plus over a long time you actually would like to see the burnout getting better if it's an effective change um, second you can't implement and you're not getting anywhere if they don't understand what they're doing and they're not bought into it and so each year what we found was um, our staff were at the, the the bad end of okay if that makes sense, which is not uncommon, I think, for teachers, right? Where they were, they were not burnt out. They were in the functional level, but they were more stressed than we'd like them to be. And we found that that's been consistent over the last three years as we've measured. So we've continued to move forward. And we've seen increases over that time in terms of understanding and buy-in. So we didn't move from a research, there's a pilot model, then there's a research model, then there's a buy-in. And then and only then do you really say, okay, we're implementing this. Like, this is now what we do. Um, and we have it as an expectation. Um, because if they don't understand it, if they're not bought in, they're not gonna do it anyway. So I don't wanna promise it of them, and I don't want to promise it to the community, because we're gonna have to be more effective in that way. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, next question, John Parks. Dr. Jenger, thank you for coming tonight. And, uh, for a great day today. What actions have you taken as a leader to ensure all students make effective progress in your district? What were the outcomes? And as you plan to close the achievement gap and help all students reach the highest possible goals in Reading, how will you think about the social and emotional well-being of a student? So the jargon is tiered systems of support, right? And that's what we try to do. But what that really means is one of the first things that we did when I came in was set up systems where you know that you know periodically during the year you want to universally screen who's failing. Do we have a plan in place for those students? Which students can we predict are failing? Do we have a plan in place for those students? We know what students did on the eighth grade MCAS. We have a pretty good idea where they're going to end up on the 10th grade MCAS if we don't intervene. So to go through all of those interventions to make sure we were identifying students who we expected to have challenges. Um, we then had a large retreat my first summer where the idea was to look across the populations of students who were experiencing challenges. Um, and the, the visual was, you know, if you took a big chart and you put dots all over it pretending it's a two-dimensional problem, of course, it's a multi-dimensional but if you put dots all across it, the idea would be that you want your programs to circle the places where the dots cluster. And you want to organize and target those systems of support to those different groups. Um, invariably, no matter what you do, some kids fall either in the overlapping edges, so you want them all to overlap a little, and some kids you have to decide where they end up. Um, and some kids need more targeting or the programs have to expand to fit those students. Um, but the result of that was creating a whole series of, um, I mean, many modifying and clarifying using a logic model what the different programs did. Um, and so we have in the school our, our uh, Summit, Reach, Compass, those are programs focused. Uh, Summit is autism spectrum. Um, not necessarily that the students are diagnosed with autism spectrum, but they have their category of challenges that are associated with that. Summit is more around social emotional disability. Compass is more around cognitive disability. Those are all in the special education programs. Then we had another layer, and I'll just give one example. Um, I know that you have a transition program here in the high school. Those are pretty common in a lot of schools. So one of the things that we're seeing in public education and across the country is we are an anxious generation. Anxiety across the country is going up, and for teenagers, um, it's going up at pretty high rates. And so we had a lot of students who would come back from long-term hospitalizations for complex or chronic mental or medical health issues. When we looked at the data of what was going on with those kids, we called it the transition program, but it wasn't the transition program. Students would go in and out of the transition program. 
program some of the students needed that consistently and so the idea then is if that's the set of needs and we're calling it a transition program but the set of needs is to support students with complex and chronic issues that may go on over long periods of time you need to design the program around that so the program now has two pieces there's harbor and which is for long-term services and programming and short stuff and the goal then was not to create a place where the students were dependent but where the students were working on skills and growth and so everybody who's in harbor has a long-term plan where their goals and expectations and limits around that behavior because our purpose is not to make them dependent on those services but to make them independent in school um, i could go on giving other examples we created a program called millbrook um, which initially was actually off campus using borrowed space and that was because we had 140 group home beds in Arlington. And so that going through systematically and looking down the pike, seeing where students are coming in and programming for all of those different groups of students was another piece of the program. Um, anyway, I could go on for a long time because in the way that you in the end close the achievement gap is by doing that systematic look. You need to have a strong DCAP. You have to have universal design. You have to um, screen through students each term that are experiencing difficulties so you catch them early and you intervene with prevention. Um, and at each one of those levels, what we found, what were the outcomes? The outcomes, uh, you asked about social emotional learning. Um, if there isn't another question about that, I'll talk more about it now. Um, but. Um, the outcomes have been rising student achievement in the high school pretty consistently over the time I've been there. A closing of achievement gaps. We've been a level one school for as long as that was possible to be one. Um, you know, rankings on other programs are pretty high. And then, obviously, this other focus is around social emotional needs. So we've talked a little bit about Summit. We've also brought in um, an advisory program, which was meant to be more consistent. Um, and systematic over time. Students follow their homerooms over four years and their advisory programs over that time. Um, the idea was to really work on both climate and culture so that there are systems within the students, systems within the teachers, relationships with teachers, and then really rigorous follow-up and intervention with students who needed challenges. Okay, thank you. Uh, Aaron Gaffin. Please give me a couple examples of how you have fostered growth and developed leadership capacity in your staff. So I try to run a pretty flat organization. Um, schools are full of capable people who all run little circles in their own programs and then with their colleagues. Um, so there's a basic theory that we have about how schools should get better that we talk about but often don't trust is gonna happen. Right? We talk about teachers using data in their practice. We talk about them setting um, expectations around standards, assessments, and curriculum, and instructional practices, and then working with personal uh, professional learning communities and within departments to develop their practices, modify their practices, improve their practices, review their curriculum over time. Um, we talk about doing that in sort of the larger school with the departments and then with the deans. Um, and then one of the things that I do on a pretty regular basis is I create what I call ad hoc working groups. There is a problem um, that we have that emerges as a challenge. And uh, anybody who wants to come work on the problem can come work on the problem. It's not usually something where we say, the administrators are going to get together, we'll work on this and we'll tell you what's going to happen. If the teachers want to come and do the work and they have the time to do it, they are welcome to do it. <laughs> right? There is too much work to be done for me to worry about who's going to be in charge. We want to be clear about who's got authority for what and on whose you know, decision it's going to be. But most of the time if we come to a decision, we're going to do that decision because it's a good idea. Um, and so we've had ad hoc working group work on things like the schedule, uh, advisory was developed by a teacher working group. Um, a lot of the work on SEL has been done by that. Most of the programs that are running at some point, ad hoc working groups work on that. Things like teacher conferences, parent communications. Um, so all of those things are running. One of the things that happens a lot is that we don't trust that process 
right? And so we treat all of the time the problems as if there's a problem of motivation or good ideas. When teachers are actually flooded with ideas, right? There's tons and tons and tons of research and information and training and activities going on. And very often what the challenge is, focus and resources um, to work on and get better at the things that we're doing. And so one of the things we've really tried to do is to not suck up the air, right? To let the teachers get better at the things they're doing, to choose a few things and to keep on working on them. Every year, I think I make my beginning of the year here our goals for the year. And almost every year, my goals for the year are, as you can see, we're following the same goals we had last year. Right? And there's nothing that we're doing this year that doesn't tie back to something we did last year. Even if it's new, if it's coming out of the blue, then I really shouldn't be doing it. Right? It should be something that we're working on over time so that we don't use up the bandwidth that people have. Public schools don't give us a lot of time or teachers a lot of time for professional development. For whatever reason, the history of contract negotiations generally has teachers arriving one or two days before school starts with just enough time to get their classrooms ready. Um, we don't give them weeks. At summer camp, I used to have a week before summer camp started to get my cabin ready, but as a teacher, I would be let in two days before school started. We'd have opening day things, I'd get my schedule, and the kids would come. That's because we expect teachers to be professionals and to show up ready to do it, but we don't give ourselves a lot of time for that. So creating the spaces and time for people to really get good at things is really important. And the collaborative problem solving example, we worked on that over four years. And last year, one of the things we did was readjust the schedule in order to create every two weeks, um, teachers had an hour long coaching session. So every teacher in the school received 16 hours of training in that approach from coaches from MGH. Um, that for schools is an awful lot of training. And we've done other things many of which I can't claim credit for. There's been a lot of effort in Arlington around giving teachers sort of opportunities to participate in graduate courses, things like the ideas course, um, courses on SEL. Uh, and those are great because you get people who become pockets, right, of expertise. We had Teachers 21, we had a group of 20, you know, when we started bringing in a lot more technology. Believe it or not, when I came to Arlington eight years ago, we had um, old, XPs that took about half an hour to boot up. And um, over the next couple of years, we got everybody MacBook Airs, and we then moved to BYOD and getting projection and sound in all of the classrooms. But that wasn't going to be useful if we were trained. So we had about 20 folks go through a graduate course. They became experts in the, the building, and they supported folks. So thank you. lots of pieces there. Uh, Sean Brandt. And Dr. Jenger, I want to echo my colleagues' thanks for putting such a uh, great day together for us today. Um, I think we all remarked that the best part of that day is typically talking to the students, and, and today was certainly no exception, so, so thank you for that. Um, my question is, uh, how would you hold educators at all levels accountable for delivering effective instruction? Please share some examples of what steps or actions you would take to foster a strong partnership between special education and general education educators. So I think those are two different questions. So I'm going to right. one at a time. Yeah. <laughs> um, question number one, I mean, first you just hold people accountable for delivering excellent instruction, right? You're clear about what it is you want and you expect folks to do it. Um, that puts it on the leadership of the district to be clear about what they want and to understand what good instruction and good practice looks like. Um, and For the vast majority of teachers, so, so there's three levels, and a lot of this has to do with the supervision and evaluation process, right? Like being really clear within that process that you're actually going to use it for coaching and improvement. The challenge is when you come into someone's classroom for evaluation, teachers, for whatever reason, get very nervous, even though they're excellent teachers. And so the first piece has to be to build sort of confidence and trust to have those relationships. The department heads need to have that principals need to have that. At the superintendent level, I'm pretty rarely going to be doing that. I'm going to be dealing with the higher level folks. Um, but what you want to really do then is be noticing the good things they're doing and getting to a place where you can have conversations about the things that you think need to be worked on. Um, and that needs
needs to happen for the most part. That coaching conversation has to happen in a place of safety. It took me a long time to figure that out as a new principal because I came in having been a facilitator and a researcher and I would come in and ask them all these probing questions and I would scare the heck out of my teachers. Um, when I really meant, this is one of the things I said to the principals, a question for me is actually just a question. Like, if I knew that I wanted you to do something different, I would tell you that I wanted you to do something different. If I asked you why you were doing something, it's because I genuinely wanted to know. But as a principal in a big building or a superintendent, um, we're Godzilla in that conversation, right? So you have to go really slow and build trust. And so there's three kinds of conversations. There's the conversation with the master teacher. When I walk into a master teacher's class, I just argue with them about their practice because they know, right? I'm like, what were you doing over there? Because they're not worried about it, right? They understand they're a master teacher and we have this respectful just conversation as colleagues about how do we get better. The vast majority of teachers, it's about identifying clearly what you want and what you think good practice is and what the zone of practice is and engaging them in that conversation to get better. And then for a small cohort of teachers, it becomes this being very clear about things that are not right. And um, on holding and creating a good teaching, I have had the experience and I now have faith that that conversation can have great outcomes. A lot of the time when you tell a teacher, I don't like the way you're teaching, right? That Say the magic word, that does not meet standard, which you don't do very often, but when you do do it, um, you can get into this situation where it's really just they think you're trying to fire them, right? And then you're not going to get anywhere in terms of actually improving their practice. But I've had the experience working with my department heads, or the district department heads, um, where we have that conversation with a teacher and they go from being a teacher who was not meeting standard to being one of the best teachers in the school. Because you really look underneath their practice and figure out not just this, but the this part. Almost always it's the this part. Because it's the, the techniques just aren't working because you don't get in here what they're about. Um, and that's a very hard thing for people to get at and it's a hard thing to build a trusting relationship on. Um, but I have seen that happen and those teachers, when they have gone through that process, become incredible teachers. Um, and the same is true, I think, of administrators. Um, special education. Special education has to be at the heart of the school, right? If the idea in the school, if the norms and implicit structure of the school, and I think this might ring on me if I'm not careful. Here we go. Um, if the implicit structure of the school really says we care about this and that then we're going to help those kids out, give those kids to special education to solve the problems because what we really care about are the students who are high or easy to teach or fun to be with, right? That's my responsibility. Um, if that's what happens, the kids are going to figure it out, the special educators are going to figure it out, the teachers are going to figure it out. Um, if you don't really sort of get the sense that what we really care about is all children, and most people do, but what we really care about is all children, that I'm not judging you as a teacher by your AP scores, right? And in fact, I had a conversation with a teacher once who got all fours and fives, and my response was, we should have more kids taking that class then, because we should be getting some threes, right? <laughs> like if, because threes is reasonably mastering the content on an AP class, so if you've got kids who are not taking your class, because they don't think they're gonna get fours and fives, we should get those kids into your class, right? Because it's not about whether or not you get fours and fives, it's about all the students having the best experience they can. Um, and it's challenging because, let me talk special education for a second. So I have to tell this story, I tell it, I've told it a bunch of times since I've been here, but. So my younger brother was born profoundly deaf. Um, and my mother 
was very committed to having him go to a particular school and under the law in the state at the time he wouldn't go to that school he would go to a different school and so she sued and she lost um, so she did what any good mother would do she lobbied the legislature and she had the law changed um, and then he did go to the school that she wanted to go to and then they hired her as their lobbyist and she became an advocate for disability rights um, and that became something that she did for a lot of years and so that's kind of the house I grew up in um, special education is challenging because it's one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation of the last hundred years it saves kids lives right I mean if you go back not that far and look at what we used to do as educational institutions to deaf students um, or to students with cognitive disabilities in terms of expectations uh, it, it horrifies you you know and even now we have students we've had students in my school who I fought to get into program after program and people said look that kid's never gonna graduate from high school and that kid's now a nurse you know, that kid's now a teacher. I know those kids. Um, the problem is that special education law does not accurately reflect human development and human relationships, right? It's categorical. It's built on entitlement and liability, right? We are held liable because we are government. We are restricted in what it is we have to do and we have to comply with civil rights. All of those things are good, they're there for a reason, and they have held institutions accountable to do what's right by kids. But it is the task of the special education department to make the bureaucratic system turn into teachers with relationships with kids that are taking chances and making things work well. And one of the challenges always for us is to ally with the parents, because if we are, work I've done this with my hands many times in meetings, if we, end up fighting about compliance, we end up working to rule. The teachers are nervous, they won't do anything but what they're supposed to do, and they're checking their boxes to do what they're supposed to do, and it's not gonna be very positive for you or your kids or the teachers, because it's the relationship and the problem solving that works. If we work the best we can together, we're gonna do this. You may want this, we all want this, but we probably can't pay for that, right? You know, So we're gonna have to talk about how we get up to there as a partnership. But we're gonna give you the best darn education we can if we work together collaboratively. So building that trust and doing it um, while complying with timelines and all those sorts of things is something that requires a lot of professional folks to be working really closely together. Um, and then it's all gonna work better as we go back to the beginning of the conversation if we hold it our heart that we're doing universal design. Okay, uh, in the event a school committee member crosses over into the area of operations or curriculum choices of the schools, how would you maintain the boundaries and secure that the work and decisions are made by the appropriate members of the leadership team and our educators? I'll give you a call. <laughs> I'll give you a call. Right? I mean, I've done that before, right? I could go on, but that's the simple thing. We have a conversation where it's like, you know, this is my part, this is your part. Let's figure out how we can do that. Okay. Aaron. Hi. Um, what culture would you create and what guidance would you give about teaching equity and social justice? In a town where the need for this work is sometimes a point of disagreement, in your role as superintendent, how would you lead this work? So one of the things I think schools tend to do well is when they model with the community what it is they want to do with the children. In class, when every time, unfortunately, we have some crisis around um, social justice or political issues that is creating conflict and stress for our students, the 
first thing we do to the staff is remind everybody we know how to do this. Right? This is within our norms. And what we need to do is remember our norms for how we talk about challenging topics in classrooms and in schools. Let's make it be facts-based. Let's set people at rest. Let's listen to each other. Let's figure out the boundaries between respectful and disrespectful conversations. And the teachers then tend to do very well. They know who their kids are. They have relationships with their kids. Every once in a while, a teacher will have a conversation that the kid doesn't quite get or they don't understand, and they're going to go, I think this might be the, um, well, it's a little bit the case for later. But um, They're going to go back to mom and dad, and they're going to be like, this teacher said that, and mom and dad are going to call me and say, this teacher said that. And I'm going to say, I understand that that's the way your student understood it. Let's go have that conversation. And invariably, you bring it back around to if the teacher was doing what they were supposed to do, which they are, the teacher was leading a conversation where kids were presenting ideas and they were moderating those conversations. The challenge with the public is the public makes interpretations about what it is we think or are trying to do as if there's a motive. And my motive is I don't have an opinion. Right? I mean, I don't have an opinion about the political solutions for things as a larger country as superintendent. I have an opinion about how to run the school district. Right? I know that I want every child to feel welcome in this school. And so sometimes I have to make affirmative statements about who is, uh, that makes it clear to different communities that they are welcome. But I don't have an opinion about the politics. I'm happy to create environments in which people can talk about them and argue about them. That's what we are good at, right? I have a very strong opinion about that. So equity now has become, I mean, it always has been, but it's become politicized because there's a lot of, a lot of specific ideas about language, right? People want you to say this because they want you to demonstrate that you are, you know, so the, the Black Lives Matter statement, right? Black Lives Matter as a principle is undeniable, right? And it is something that we have to say and articulate as educators. And why with that, what I mean is, the first house I ever bought had in the deed a statement from 1928 that said it could not be sold to non-Caucasians. When I was six or seven years old, my mother took me to go look at an apartment and told me that I should be quiet because she was going to um, tell the guy that dad worked at the local GM plant. And the guy showed us the apartment and it was a very nice apartment and we got back in the car and my mother was furious because the day before an African American woman whose husband who worked at the GM plant had been told there was no apartment available. Um, not that long ago my neighbor who is African American was asked by a woman who lived not far away whether she was the nanny while she sat in her own front steps. So, and, and I, as a principal, suspend students of color three to four times more than their proportion of the population. So when a student comes to me and says, when you say all lives matter, do you really mean all? Um, I have to be clear and make that statement. That does not mean that I, as principal, am expressing an opinion about the political movement that is the Black Lives Matter movement. That's a conversation for me to lead. Right? That's a conversation to us, for us to have. But that's not one for me to take a stand on. It's one for me to educate students about. Um, and so I think we just need to articulate that over and over again. And I had a teacher, so we had an incident where we, many teachers had put these safe zone stickers up for LGBTQ students on their doors. And somebody, we realized, had scraped them all off. So the teachers put them back up again, and somebody scraped them all off again. So it was clear that it was intentional. And so someone put up on their door, everybody is welcome in my classroom, even you, you the person who scraped off my safe zone sticker. Right? Like That's the message that we have to give, right? Because there are reasons why people, a 
object to those stickers too right and there are reasons why those conversations have to be engaged in and those kids and the children of those folks are in our classrooms and the conversation has to happen and it has to be open to everybody thank you thank you uh, Carla is the so uh, dr. Jango will write it at halfway point at this point you're you're doing great uh, <laughs> kind of halfway through the time, uh, just so you're aware. Uh, Carl? Great. Thank you, Chuck. At the time you begin your tenure at Reading Public School District, the country and community will have likely emerged or will have begun emerging from the COVID-19 crisis. Please talk about how you will re-engage staff, students, and community to a sense of normalcy moving forward. How will you build the trust and previous confidence in the Reading Public Schools? So one of the things that's been, too, so challenging about the COVID-19 pandemic is, one, it's broken everybody's expectations. People are not good with change, uncertainty, um, and isolation. And that has been what the last year has been characterized by. And isolation I separate because we've been dealing with this change and uncertainty and I have not been able to deliver the program that most people in the community would like in Arlington High School. Um, and I know you've had a lot of challenges here in Reading. I can explain till I'm blue in the face why it is logistically not possible to do what it is we would like to do. I can break out this process to try to break out the goals. So what we tried to do is say, okay, we did focus groups. We said, what are we actually trying to solve as a problem? Not the solution, hybrid. I want hybrid, I want half time, I want four days of school. Those are the solutions that people bring to us. But I had the conversation to say, let's, what's the problem? Let's try to figure out how, given what we have, we can address the problem. I think for most folks, by doing that and having a process that was honest and clear and, and forthright and transparent, the trust is there. But for many folks, the trust is not because they're like, you didn't deliver, right? We expected to get this and we didn't get it. I can only say that as an administrator, as a superintendent, and as a principal, I can't process, promise you that we can deliver always the product you want. What I can only promise you is that we will go through a process where we identify what the real problems are, we dig down into those problems as best we can, we bring your feedback and your preferences together, we listen to what it is you want to do. In the end, we came up with a model that wasn't very dissimilar from the one I think you've been doing most recently in Reading, in terms of being able to bring in kids a couple of days every couple of weeks. But when we asked the community how well that solved the various different goals of the community, it was not their preference. So in the end, the model we have now, which is not the one that people would have wanted for COVID, was the leading choice of the community, which is to actually be primarily remote, um, to bring students in for a class every other week in person, um, which is actually less than we could. We could do more than that, but in terms of the programming and the way it works, that's the way people requested that we function. And then we created other programs, so we've now created an in-person academy, which is a small four-day week program for students um, who really need it. And it turns out we've been inviting people. We have capacity still to bring more students into the building than are choosing to come in, even though we have that programming. So it's sort of interesting where we are. The result, and I will say, I haven't seen the end of semester grades at this point, but as we've tracked throughout, while most schools are experiencing failure rates that are higher than normal, our failure rates are the same. Um, and um, we did a big screening, and what we found was high levels of sort of elevated stress, but we have not experienced higher levels of hospitalizations really severe mental illness, which we hope we continue. We're going to keep working on that. Um, so I think when I 
say that you can restore trust. I think the way you restore trust is by continuing to demonstrate competence, integrity, respect, and regard. Right? You just have to be. The thing I said to everybody was, normally I would spend 90 days walking around asking people what was going on before I diagnosed big issues to deal with. I'm going to have about 30 days to make a plan to figure out how stuff's going to open up in the fall. And I'm going to have to demonstrate competence. I'm going to have to make my decisions in the right way. It's going to have to come from respect, where you're listening to the community and getting a lot of feedback and making the best decisions you can, where you're as transparent as possible. And that will either build trust or we'll be in a lot of trouble. Um, you know. And then the second piece, I think, had to do with how will we actually transition. I think I would use the same model that I talked about in terms of the tiered system of support. I think you have to go through all of the information you have that helps you identify what are the needs of students and how are you going to build programming to support those needs of students. If you have students who um, you know have fallen behind academically, are we identifying those students by doing reasonable assessments of what their academic needs are? And is it something where it's so widespread we're ramping up the program in general, or is it something where we need to target special services? If we know we have students who are having a really hard time coming into the building because they've been isolated for so long and they're not still feeling comfortable, we have to identify what those numbers are going to look like and think about how we continue to provide remote services for those students. Um, and at the same time, do the same kind of thing we've done with our Harbor program, which is figure out how those remote services are a pathway to bring them back into the school. And so you have to build all of those programs and sort of work through all of them. What did they say in the Martian? You just work the problem, right? You figure out what it all has and you work the problem. Okay, thank you. Describe your budget experience in both good financial times and difficult financial times. Also, what is your vision of how an ideal budget process works? And additionally, full day kindergarten is a fee-based program in Reading with 90 plus percent participation. Explain how you would convert this to a tuition free, free program for all with the understanding that you would need to compensate for a 1 million plus shortfall. One million plus is what it would cost to create um, free, free kindergarten. Correct. Yeah. So, when I was a principal in Maine, Maine Mount Desert Island High School is a funny organization. It's created by a special act of the legislature. So we actually had our own um, school committee, and I actually ran the budget for that school committee, and then worked with the uh, business office. We had a superintendent, he was great, and I give him a lot of credit, but I had a lot more control than I have here in my current situation. So my first year there, October rolls around, and we've got a $9 million budget, and the state tells us they're cutting our funding. So we've got a half million dollar hole. And you guys know how budgets work. We've already spent that money. This, the ship is sailing, we've hired our staff, that's 90% of your budget, those folks aren't going anywhere. And so we had to go through with a comb every single program, every single line, every single position to figure out how we could reorganize. Um, we cut one, or I think one secretarial position, but we really, other than that, we managed to excess folks that were already sort of leaving or not fill positions that were open, reorganized. We filled the half million dollar budget, and I can explain a little bit about how, and it relates to how I would hope to run a budget process. And over the next four years, um, we actually kept the budget balanced, ran the programs that we had run, and gave the taxpayers a tax break on my fourth year on my way out the door. Um, I'm not promising I can do that here. <laughs> um, but the way we did that was, again, by dividing the budget process into essentially four phases. Because as you guys know, I show up in September, I'm running this year's budget, and the week after we get started, they start asking me for what we're gonna do for the new budget process. And the 
that budget process means that we're now projecting out for a year from now what it is we're going to do. So almost immediately out of the gate, I'm asking my department heads to project actually what they need to spend this year in order to be able to do things because we built the budget we're working on right now last year anyway. And we're doing, and we started immediately, so we built that budget, we revised this year's budget to figure out where we were going to actually spend the money for the whole rest of the year. So in our current practice, there's a tendency that around March and April, we get asked to freeze our budgets and say, what do we need to finish the year? We would do that in October. Um, because we wanted to figure out when we were going to spend the money and what money we could set aside and how we could repurpose. And so as those two processes are going forward, we're basically running, we're already thinking about next year's process in our spending this year. The thing that that allowed us, to, and I had a great business manager, you know, and it, because it makes huge difference if I can know what my, I mean, there's the revenues coming in from here, there's the state funding that we don't know we're going to get, right? There's all those pieces going together. But if I have control over what's going on with my spending and expenses, I can fly a lot closer to the ground. Um, so in the end, we had a lot of, you know, there's lots of contingencies built into these budgets. And the more tightly you can run the budgets, the more tightly people know they're going to get the money they need, the less contingency they need to build into the budget. So my department heads could come to me and say, you know, I don't need to buy the AP class $15,000 worth of AP taxes this year. It turns out we can wait till next year to buy them. But I have to know I'm going to have $15,000 next year or I'm going to spend the money this year. Because the tendency in these in fiscal budgets is it's a use it or lose it, right? If I don't spend the money this year, in fact, if I don't spend it by March, it's very likely to get frozen and then I won't have it. That does not lead to people making as efficient a use of the funding as they want, as they ought to. And so you have to build, again, it's all about trust and communication. You have to build trust within all of the different departments. And I'll give one last example. I used to ask the department heads to give me three budgets. What you absolutely need to survive, what you think is reasonable, and then what you would ask for if there was just lots of money out there all of a sudden. And my first couple of years, there were a few of them who wouldn't give me three budgets. They would just say, I'm giving you one budget. It's what I absolutely need to survive because I know that's what you're going to give me anyway. So why would I give you the other two so you can just cut them? Um, and uh, after a couple of years of realizing we will find a way to get you the funds that you need to run reasonably, not always just bare bones, people started giving you a lot more useful information because they weren't boxing out to try to make it so that they had funding. Thank you. Uh, John Parks. Oh, you wanted to know about kindergarten? Oh, I'm I don't sorry, know. yes. It's great. I thought that was. Yeah, I mean, I think it's in there. I mean, in the end, the answer with kindergarten is I, I have to look at your budget to tell you where the money is, right? Um, I think one thing that you can do though is you can do these things in little pieces, right? You, you fund parts of the programming over a period of time, so eventually it's absorbed into the budget. Sorry. Please discuss your process for goal setting, implementation, and monitoring. I think I think I've sort of described it a little bit already. So one of the things, obviously, in a new district, is we talk about superintendents being visionary, but it's not really about coming in and telling you what my vision is. It's about finding out and then articulating what our vision is. So that's the first piece. The second piece is, as I said before, not changing goals all the time. The reality is we most of the time don't have a whole lot of new goals every year. We just reframe them and reframe them over and over again. So if in fact what is likely is that you're going to have a social emotional learning goal of some sort, because 
students' well-being is really important, and we're realizing more and more that they don't grow well if you don't focus on that. You're going to have an equity goal because if you don't have a, an eye and a lens and equity in everything you do, um, it, it gets lost. If we did the other thing perfectly, we wouldn't have to do equity, but we don't. And then you're going to have an academic achievement goal because that is what we are about. We are schools. Um, and then underlying that, you're going to have cross-cutting functional goals of actually running things competently in a budget and giving people good professional development and hiring effective staff and supervising them. Like, that's going to be your goals. It's going to be your goals every year. Um, and so having the conversation about how have we changed our understanding about that, what do we mean by that, how is that reflected in, there, in our philosophy, that's going to be important. Um, so then the second piece becomes, there's the practical, pragmatic, let's organize, let's run the universe by spreadsheets. Um, and I guess one thing I would say is, there is a tendency in education to want to run things by algorithm, right, level one schools, right, um, which is a bad idea. I had a friend who once wrote an article said we should treat schools more like baseball. And what he meant was like, schools have thousands of things going on. And we try to measure an entire school district or an entire school as a level one school. We wouldn't even do that with a baseball player, right? They make better use of statistics on baseball teams than they do in public schools an awful lot of the time. And the public can talk about it. If you went into a um, cocktail party and you said to somebody, you know, is Mahomes better than Tom Brady? Great, sorry. Um, People could talk statistics for an hour, right? But if you walked in and said, what's our US News World Report ranking? You get one number and you're done, right? It doesn't make any sense. So I want to manage my spreadsheet, right? Really looking through all of these programs and like I said, deciding, looking back down the pipeline, looking forward up the pipeline, figuring out what our needs are, looking ahead and reasoning back to actual processes and programs. That's the business piece of the job. Um, but then the second piece is this implementation of educational change. And there, there's sort of a lot of things that have to be going on at the same time. One is building common understandings by giving common experiences so we can talk to each other. So that's where you do things like reading groups. You just read books together and you talk about the books so that we know what we're talking about. You have common experiences. You go see the same thing in a classroom so you can give examples and draw from common examples so we're not talking past each other. Because educational rhetoric is useless in actually understanding what you're doing. I used to do educational research and we'd go to schools and they'd say, we're doing whole language. And we'd say, what does that mean? Like, we were educational researchers. We'd go into the school and we'd say, like, give me three things that you do that makes this whole language. And like, people couldn't really answer except for that they rearrange their desks. Um, and, you know, you'd go into three classrooms and their version would be different. So you really have to have those common experiences. And that just builds the ability to have a conversation. Then you have to, at the same time, start giving people new practices and trying things out. So that's a piloting process. It's not an implementation process. We should avoid implementing things. I'll go back and say that again. We should avoid implementing things until we know they work, until we know that people aren't burnt out, that they understand the idea, um, and that they're bought into the idea. Because if we don't, we're just going to waste everybody's time. Um, and oh, I'll stop there. Talk about your views on school safety and the various drills that have been established by state and national leaders. Do you think that there is sufficient evidence to support these drills across all levels? So I became a principal for the first time in September of 2001. And the first meeting I was planning on having was hi, I'm the new principal, and isn't it great that I'm here, ended up being, these are the police and fire departments and the people who keep you safe. And my first
first big act as a principal was changing all the locks in the building. Um, that changed significantly, and we've had all many things since then. Our sense of safety and how we run schools. So I have been trained and retrained in the latest versions of how we run safe schools many, many times. We've worked really closely with our police, with our local STARS, MLEC STARS. We've had a number of crises since I've been at Arlington High School. And we've trained our students at the high school level in Alice and throughout the district. So I would say there's, a, there's an ambivalence hiding in that question which I share. Um, as a weird piece of my research, a lot of the work I did was around how people function under crises. And so I think it's really important as educators, when the police and the, the incident command folks come and talk, they're, they're amazing. I'll give an example in a minute about what we're able to do and how we function as a team. Um, but they're police officers and their focus is training, 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 because they're gonna be putting themselves in these situations, right? And they wanna know how to function in those situations. But when we were doing our training for um, back in 2001, one of my teachers said, shouldn't we practice climbing out the windows because somebody could block the halls? which seemed perfectly reasonable. And the, lo the, the fellow who was there said, so if we climb out the windows, I, I, there's a 100% chance someone's gonna break their legs. And the chances that that particular, one, you even have an incident, but second of all, if you have an incident, that the actual scenario means you have to climb out the window is so small that it's really not worth breaking somebody's legs. Um, and the goal is not to be perfect. The goal is to give kids routines. In situations of stress, people fall back on their learned behaviors and routines. And so now I'll just go to an example. So what we've done is we've tried to make it pretty low key in the high school. We want people to think about how do you lock your doors, think about how you secure your doors, think about the ways out of the building. Practice when they get the message, you gotta get out of the building, there's somebody over here, don't go over there, to do that. But we don't try to make it super realistic. We just try to make it super routine. So a number of years ago, I don't know if you remember, there was this, uh, one of the many nasty things that have happened in the last 10 years was spoofing, where people would set up robocalls using Skype and they would call in bomb threats. And they would actually call in bomb threats to multiple schools. Now Arlington is at the top of the alphabet, so we got like one of the first and then we got multiples of them. The first time we got the call, the call said that there were bombs in the building and snipers outside. Um, and we, because we had worked closely with the police, all very calmly, like I didn't think there were bombs in the building and I didn't think there were snipers outside and we made that clear to the community the students, but we also felt we had a conversation with the chief and the superintendent. It was a rare day when everybody was on duty, I just want to say this. But we managed to make a decision about how we were going to handle it in about 10 minutes. And we then, it was freezing, it was in the middle of the winter. We brought in a city bus to take students who needed, who couldn't go home down to town hall. We brought in school buses and moved the students um, from the preschool to another location. The police secured the outside of all three buildings because our building is huge. It's 400,000 square feet, a mile and a half of hallways. Um, and in thirds, we evacuated the building with cover from the police. And the time, from the time when we made the decision, I think until we had emptied out the building was about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we got to the point after that, actually, where, because we kept getting these bomb threats, where we would lock, we would just shut down, sweep the halls, have the kids check their bags, and go on with class. And one of the comments that the students said was they found it very reassuring, because I would get on the loudspeaker and I would say, hello. <laughs> and I 
just sounded annoyed. Um, in fact, the one time a couple years later, I was in a rush and I just grabbed the phone and I said, I can't remember what I said, but whatever it was it started with, this is not. And I think it was like, I was just trying to let them know that some bus wasn't leaving for something, but I was kind of out of breath. They said everybody got scared because they'd never sound, heard me sound like in a rush or stressed on the radio. And they said, this is not anything important. And then I went on and they dealt with it. So I, I guess it's a little of both. I think we have to be really careful because we get in the habit of taking our trauma and putting it on the kids. But at the same time, having kids practice, I mean, I don't want to get too graphic, but in Newtown, the second, no, the first classroom, yeah, in the first classroom, the students didn't shelter in place in the way that they were being taught at the time. But the, pro, the, the route that the students used to leave the building after they followed it was not the best route. They actually followed a route that went right past the window of the classroom and they followed their fire drill route, right? Because in incidents of stress, people fall back on overlearned behavior giving people a few options to handle things in situations is helpful. Where it has been most helpful to us is in small incidents, yelling parents in the halls, right? kids fighting, um, something flooding or breaking in the building, which happens relatively frequently. And so you don't have to practice the really scary versions in order to get good at leaving the building in a hurry or locking yourself in a room. That's what we need to really focus on. Thank you. Uh, Carla? Um, would, can you please tell us about any experience you may have in school construction or renovation? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, which we heard a lot about today. <laughs> if you would like to relate it, I'll give you a sequel, if you'd like to relate it to our situation with sure. Killam Elementary, that would be great. Yeah, so we have a building, the oldest corner of which is over 100 years old. That's actually the best building. That's the one we would have kept if we were going to keep any of them. Um, it goes downhill from there. Um, so I came in about eight years ago, went around the building, and it was a pretty much a wreck. Um, and we've gotten it a lot better, but obviously not better enough. So the smart thing I did, which I must have been really smart then now because it turns out to have worked really well, was that realizing we were going to be looking to get a new building, that there would be a statement of interest, that we would be going through that process. We actually started like seven years ago doing research into new buildings. We created a community called the Future Building Committee. It was an intentional pun because we were building the future and it was the future building. Um, and the idea was to think not just about you know what do we want in a building, but how do we want to teach. Right, so the group, each, the group within, there was a small, this was one of these working groups, right, volunteers from different departments came together and had those conversations. We then ran conversations within each department. And the idea was to have visions about how they wanted to teach while we were being restrained by the current building and then what we would want to see in the new building. We came up with frameworks for different groups to go out and do research and study so that the library group went out and looked at libraries, the science group went out and looked at labs, performing arts went out and looked at performing arts, you know, a group of students talked about student spaces. We had teachers talk about just a general ideal classroom. And so people, we took groups out to look at schools that we thought were good examples. Um, and we really started creating these lists of both how we wanted to teach and then kind of what would be reflected in that. Then the second piece was to say, if that's the way we want to teach, we should start now. There's no reason, if you think you're going to want a fabulous fab lab or a maker space, you know, a multi-purpose interdisciplinary fabrication space, a fancy version of a wood shop with good metal working and 3D printers for the rest of us. Um, if you want to have that in the new building and we didn't have one, um, we had an old wood shop that wasn't in use. People aren't going to build it for you because you think you might use it in the future. Right? People aren't going to build you a production studio to make videos if people aren't making videos. People aren't going to build you a CAD lab if you don't have a CAD program. Um, people aren't going to build you a language immersion lab if you're not doing immersive work in terms of the language department. And so all of the folks started working on those things, which of course 
also meant that they then had a better idea of what those facilities would actually look like and have those conversations. That meant we were in really good shape to do two things. When you're making your case in your statement of interest about why you need a new building, simply saying that this building is cruddy or we don't have enough space is good, but saying here are all these programs and all these things we are doing that we are not able to do because of this building is much more compelling. The MSBA is looking to build good buildings in places that need them and are going to support and make use of them, right? And so a town like Arlington and a town like Reading, we're not at the top of the needy list. There are much needier communities than we are. Um, so part of how you get in there is because you demonstrate how the value of the building is going to change students' lives in significant ways. The good thing about having done that was when we did the visioning process with the rest of the community and we got our little sort of two-page framework for how it was and the architect said, so what do you guys think you want STEM, you know, your science labs to look like? They got handed a five-page paper with descriptions of where the, the doorknobs were going to go. And I'll just give one example because it's, it's one of my favorites. There's a stairwell currently being built right in front of my office. And in that stairwell, the railings are a foot apart. In the rest of the building, the railings go straight up because there's no reason to make the whole stairwell an extra foot wide. The reason that's there was because the science department told them that they wanted a place in the building where they could drop things 40 feet. And so the purpose of that stairwell is for all of the various different engineering problems they have that involve dropping things down stairwells. And so, you know, those sorts of choices have been made all through the building because people um, really thought through what it is they were going to do. So your program. I mean, I think, I, I don't know enough of the details, but I think the strongest case, as I understand it from the folks I talked to, in addition to the educational needs of all the students that are not being well served, I mean, preschool and kindergarten are probably the most cost-effective research-based strategy for improving outcomes for students. Um, you know, and if you look at educational equity, um, when I was an elementary principal, you know, the difference between students who showed up having had thousands of hours of experience with books, who knew that books had a beginning, a middle, and an end, they understood the alphabet, they understood how stories work, and students who walked in and didn't really understand that books had stories in them, right? And those, that's a huge gap coming right in the door. Um, so that's the first piece. The second piece is that the spaces that you're currently using for your preschool and your kindergarten are restricting other programming across the district. Um, so having those spaces, I think, is going to be really important. And then it's just a matter of writing a very compelling, community-supported, building a community process, getting interest in the community. We ran tours. They were the funniest tours I've ever read, led. You know, leading tours of your building as the principal, telling people how bad it is, um, is not usually what I do. Um, and um, everything's fine. Everything's safe. We're fine here. We are doing just fine. But, oh, this building is terrible. Um, and then you'd explain why. Um, so I think doing that whole process. And then, without a doubt, the thing that has made this process, I think, be so effective is we had an unbelievable team. Like, our building committee, Dr. Bodie put, and, Dr. and Adam Chaplin put that together. I can't claim any credit for that. There's so much skill and thought and thoughtfulness, you know, in terms of all the people on there, people who are dealing with communications, people who deal with the community, people who understand the trades, people who understand the budgets, people who understand architecture, people who understand sustainability. Um, and everybody's committed not to their agenda but to working together as a team. We, we actually disagreed on something most recently. We had a split vote 50-50. Um, and I, I laughed as I voted. I was like, we never really disagree like this. Everybody argues until we figure out what we can agree on and try to come to consensus. Thank you. Tom. So Tom is going to read the question that uh, Dorothy sent you uh, in advance. 
it was a time check as well. We are at yeah. one hour and 15 minutes. Um, so with this and your closing statement, if there's any follow-up questions by the committee for the next 15 or so. So the scenario which you received, but for the public is the parent of an eighth grader objects to the teaching technique of their student's math teacher who gives a weekend problem of the week over the year to be solved by Monday. However, if no student can solve the problem and explain the method to the class, the teacher refuses to give the answer or method for finding it. Parents who have been trying to help their children solve the problems note that some kids spend hours of weekend time wrestling with the challenge, often failing. Requests by parents to give the answers and method to the students does not receive a response. Things come to, the head, to a head at the PTO meeting when a parent with a math background points out that some problems pose a challenge for college math majors. Failing to give answers builds esteem problems for students, especially girls who are stereotyped unfairly as not ready for math. The teacher, however, is adamant. The teacher responds that it's my classroom and I do what I want. The principal who hired the teacher explains that it's important for kids to recognize the role of unanswered questions in their lives. The parent escalates to the school committee member and demands that this, parent, that this practice stop. Some of their kids are being turned off to math and feel humiliated by the teacher. The board member calls the superintendent and demands that something be done. Walk through the process that you would use to resolve this situation. So before I walk through how I would do this, I, 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 when I read that, I thought to myself, the first thing I see in that case is a breakdown in the norms and processes that I want to set up as a superintendent. Right? But if I've got um, people processing their dis displeasure with the teacher in a class in PTO meetings um, and at school committee meetings and a teacher saying, it's my class, I can do what I want. Um, and uh, school committee members demanding that I handle things. The, 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 the one piece of that whole conversation that was most appropriate to the norms and expectations for how we function um, that I'd want to see is that the school committee member called the superintendent and said, we got a problem, you got to deal with it. Um, because what you want to do from the start is create a process where the teachers, you get kids who are experiencing a lot of stress and anxiety and harm, you know, and, and challenge and we're not listening to them. I'm not saying we're necessarily going to do what they want, but we're not listening to them, right? So their parents are going off looking for venues in which to be heard. So the first rule is the golden rule. You go to the teacher and if that's not working because the teacher's not hearing you, then you follow the chain of command. And so somehow that's made its way fast the teacher, the department head, the dean, the principal, to the PTO meeting, the school committee, and then back to me. Right, so at each stage, somebody should have been conveying people back to have the conversation. Um, so that's the first thing: is to just build those norms and expectations. That you know, if you call me and you say, "Hey, this teacher's doing whatever," I'm going to say, "Have you talked to the teacher?" And if you say, "Yeah," and the guy didn't listen to me at all, I'm going to say, "Would you like some help going to talk to the teacher again?" Right, and so then it's going to be the department head or the dean or me, and we're going to probably run conversation that models around collaborative problem solving, which is we start by listening to the parent's point of view and the student's point of view, and we keep on listening until we understand what their perspective is. Right? We don't stop until that's the case, because people feel heard, and we actually express empathy and understand what their things are. 90% of the problem gets solved. And then we hear from the teacher what it is they're doing and why it is they're doing it. Underlying some of that conversation, there was some legitimate educational purpose much as it's hard to understand from the case, right? The teacher was trying to have students understand, um, as he said, the challenge of unsolvable problems. And I, I have experiences in my own life in graduate school and college of teachers giving me unsolvable problems. And kids that didn't know how to handle those fell apart. I actually had a roommate who failed the class because he could not get past on an exam an unsolvable problem that a bunch of the rest of us set up the problem, figured out that we didn't know how to do it, and moved on. Um, and um, so it's an important skill. But there's a mismatch going on. Because, and so now I'll go to how you solve it. So I'm just gonna, two pieces. One, I'm gonna start with a hypothesis, because at some point I'm gonna push everybody back to have that collaborative conversation. And my hypothesis is, Kids aren't upset because they can't solve the problem. 
kids can't solve problems all the time. Kids are upset because the teacher's grading them on the problem. Now, I don't know that it's not in the case, but that's my guess. And so the teacher is trying to teach them work habits around trying to do this and persisting at doing this and being comfortable with not being able to solve things all the time or not having certainty. That's a reasonable thing. But giving them a zero for not being able to solve the problem is not measuring them on the thing that it is they're being asked to learn. If they're being asked to learn how you handle uncertainty and whatever, they probably learned that. And so maybe they met the standard. Did you teach them how to, as I said, set up the problem and then figure out you didn't know how to do it and write, I don't know how to do this and move on? Um, so that's my hypothesis. But what's the process we go through? Um, I call the principle, right? Because it's this is a principle level problem. Um, as principal, I'd probably get involved, but I try to stay as far away from it as possible, to be honest. I would call the principal. I'd ask the principal what's going on. At some point, we're going to talk to the teacher and say, explain to me what's going on. And you're going to talk to the parents that are most upset and say, explain to me what's going on. That may or may not be me that has that conversation. And then at some point, and this just be, depends on where you are, ideally, you're going to be able to bring those folks together to have that conversation. Now, once things have escalated to this point, um, you're at that same problem I talked about before, where the parents are coming to you with a solution. The solution is, this is a bad practice. Get rid of it. Um, and what they need to do is partner with the teacher and partner with the students to figure out what the issues are in order to more effectively achieve their goals. Because the kids are missing the point. The kids are, whatever the teacher thinks they're doing, the kids have missed it, right? Um, but then the parents are coming um, with what I, joke, I jokingly call in school the, the first level of the inappropriate request. The first level of the inappropriate request is they come and they tell me what to do, right? As opposed to they come and they say, I have a problem, right? My kid is upset. This teacher's giving them his thing. The kids are getting a zero on it. The kids are working their, their tails off. This is really frustrating for them because they don't understand why they're doing it. They're doing what they're supposed to do, and they're still getting a zero. And then, like, that's a reasonable problem. Let's go talk to the teacher. 90% of the time, you can solve it. When it gets to this point, it's much harder to solve, right? Everyone's elevated. Um, and, uh, you know, most of the time you can work it through. The question is always, would I tell the teacher to stop doing it? That's what the parent wants to know. I will usually avoid answering that question. But for the most part, I'm not going to tell the teacher to stop doing it if it is. Within professional norms and standards, within their authority and within their discretion, I would say Grading students for that assignment does not appear to be within professional standards. So I would have to hear the teacher explain to me why. And then I wouldn't tell them to change it. I'd just tell them that they were engaging in a practice that didn't meet standards, which is usually going to cause a teacher to change their practice. OK, so we, we have about uh, five minutes left. Uh, we could probably fit in a couple of follow-ups, and I'll, I want to give you an opportunity to, to make any final statement if you'd like. Uh, so, John, did you have a call? You did the other. Anyone else? Okay. Um, you talked about special education, and we've had some changes over the last year with COVID. How would you tie technology into increasing special education outcomes?
allows us to create activities that are more individualized and more engaging. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I went to Williams College. Williams College, they said the best education was Mark Hopkins at one end of the law, the teacher at the, the student at the other end of the law, and a book between them. Um, the technology, there are, there are many great examples I've seen with autistic students, with you know, um, graphic organizers and graphic um, communication devices. There's FM, you know, sound systems that we're going to put all throughout the building because they're very helpful for letting students with ADHD hear so that they get the teacher's attention but not have it sound loud and elevated. So there's all kinds of um, technology that can make a really positive difference. And so I think being um, open to and creative about using those things is super important. Um, I also think that an awful lot of technology is, at this point in time, oversold. There's an awful lot of programming that I see that in the end is a fancy version of film strips, um, you know, just with better technology. Thank you. So, uh, if you wanted to make any closing remarks. Uh, only to say how much I've enjoyed the process, how much I've appreciated meeting all of you. Um, again, how impressed I am by the effort everyone's making. The more I've had this conversation, it's a, someone said in the process, it's a mutual courtship, as I had an opportunity to meet people like the town manager and the administrative team. It's made me feel better about the thing I would regret the most about leaving Arlington, which is leaving the team that I've had there. It's been a really strong team that I have loved to work with. It's clearly a team of people who are passionate about what goes on in schools um, with whom I would be honored to work. Um, I think the students that I met and the students that I know from my experiences with Reading again are a group of students that I would love to become part of that community and go to their football games and have you know coffees with their parents and figure out how to become a real visible part of this community. Um, and you know, as you can see from me, there's often and, and you know this is what you're going to get, right? There is often sort of a, this is the way we talk about doing it, and most of the time I'm going to go above and below and think about how to pull it apart and then put it back together again. That's just the way in which I address issues. It does mean that sometimes I'm a little long-winded, um, but I think you will get a person who is committed to thinking creatively and in entrepreneurial and interesting ways about how we can really move the district forward and make a positive difference for children. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. And, and we sincerely thank you uh, for, for uh, applying for the opportunity and, and good job. Thank you. So my kids wanted to know, how late do you plan to go tomorrow night? Yeah. I can make the decision easy for you. I'm just yeah. telling you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Very careful. At least it's not snowing tonight. take a uh, three minute recess
welcome uh, Dr. Zadrovac. Uh, uh, so tonight we'll, so we, we originally had scheduled 75 minutes, but uh, last night we went to 90, so we extended that same courtesy to everyone. So you'll have 90 minutes, uh, start with an opening statement, the committee will ask questions and then this time for follow up. We'll do that, and then you can make a closing statement. So, welcome, congratulations for uh, for being a finalist, and we're very excited to hear what you have to say tonight. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you, and uh, and thank you for uh, for the honor of being a finalist here for your superintendent's position. Um, it's uh, as I'm sure you know, the process is is quite an interesting one and involved, and uh, and I think a good process to help. Hopefully you get to know the candidates and the candidates get to know more um, about Reading. Um, I, um, as you know, I've been the superintendent in Portsmouth, New Hampshire for the last six years and have been in that district for um, about 16. And, um, you know, I, as I said in my initial interview, um, really looking at, um, you know, trying to find a, a perhaps a, another chapter in my professional career, um, I think it's, it's healthy for me, it's healthy for organizations to, you know, to grow. And so um, started to uh, look around a little bit to what, what districts might, from my perspective, be a good match and fit. And um, was really excited to see your opening. And uh, I knew a little bit about Reading, but I've certainly learned a lot more. And uh, really excited to, um, to continue to pursue this. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, and then went to school up in New Hampshire and have been there ever since. Um, I, you, you've seen uh, my history a little bit, I'm sure. So uh, aside from being a teacher um, and curriculum coordinator, really went into central office administration and did some interim positions as uh, principals, one at the elementary level and one at the high school level. And, and have enjoyed every single facet and every single role I've been in. in the, 30 years of my career and uh, and really um, again just just look forward to um, to continuing to grow as an educational leader I I live with education I have two uh, daughters who are in the high school in Portsmouth right now and my wife is a teacher uh, in another district in New Hampshire and uh, and sort of in the in the family in the history and uh, and really just look forward to continuing that and uh, uh, hopefully um, finding out very good, thank you. Tom Weiss. Uh, Zadrovec for coming once again. Um, it's been a pleasure to get to know you throughout this process. Um, looking forward to the rest of it for this evening. Uh, my question is in specific about Reading. So what appeals to you specifically about coming to work for Reading Public Schools? What are some areas where you see a need for change or that you would like to build upon? And further, how do you see your particular skill sets working effectively for us? Or why do your skills match our needs? Yeah, thanks, Tom. I, uh, I you know, I, what I said, and I think I said this in an initial interview, some things um, that I think schools deal with are, are pretty universal, you know, and certainly um, in the last 10 months that we've, you know, weathered this pandemic, we've all been dealing with similar kinds of issues. Um, but to really, you know, take a deeper dive into Reading has been one of the more uh, enlightening pieces for me. Uh, just to, you know, just to look at what some of the issues in front of you are, um, what some of the goals you have, um, and I think we touched on them a little bit in the first interview with the committee, but um, when I look at Reading, I look at a, a district in good shape and, and with a lot of really, really good people, and the thing that I took away from my site visit here that was perhaps the most exciting for me was just getting a chance to meet and talk with those folks people here a little more and uh, and you know I got probably to spend the most time with the smaller groups uh, the administrators um, central office and building and some students and, uh, and I, I got to say um, just really impressed uh, with the level of, of talent and the dedication and just um, and just the personality too just being able to work together as a team um, I've taken a lot of time and, uh, and a bit of if I have pride in anything in Portsmouth, it's, it's building a team, building a leadership team, building a team approach to the issues we face. Uh, and in Reading, I see that same kind of opportunity as I think you have um, a lot of really talented people and I think working together as a leadership team and building that kind of approach in collaboration, it can be really effective. Um, looking
looking specifically at some of your goals around, uh, say, uh, literacy strategies and, and some of the equity work that you're doing uh, do fall pretty nicely into some of the experiences I've had and some of the passions I have. And so um, I certainly would look forward to learning more about the strategies in place for moving forward on those goals. Um, we've spent a lot of time in Portsmouth working through um, how we collaborate effectively with each other, how do we build effective teams. Um, we utilize the professional learning community model with uh, grade level teams, uh, essentially setting strategic goals and monitoring our progress to them, uh, and being diligent and, uh, and making sure that we're, uh, again, collaborating towards desired results. Um, and we've seen some great success, and, I, I, and again, I don't know enough yet about uh, how the teams work here in monitoring those same kinds of uh, goals and progress to them, but I do see those goals evident, and, uh, and I think that's a, a great opportunity. Um, the work of equity is, is, a, is a passion of mine and, and has been a real focus in Portsmouth the last few years, uh, and again, I think um, there's a, a lot of uh, really great opportunity um, in front of us in terms of how we can best engage in inclusive community and best work towards uh, making sure that um, you know we build uh, a stronger culture stronger work uh, towards towards those goals um, and again with a lot of uh, work in Portsmouth I know that we've done around that involving students involving parents uh, involving community partners um, I just see some great great potential there um, so I, I would say my skill set has really focused in on uh, team development, leadership development among the, um, the building administrators, certainly, uh, talent development among teachers, um, and really taking, uh, a, a, you know, to coin a phrase, a, a district from good to great, or great to excellent, and that's really been a focus of mine. Thank you. Carla? Thank you for coming in, Stephen. I hope you're a bit of a night owl. <laughs> Used to it. <laughs> um, decision making is a two-edged sword. Some situations call for decisiveness right at the start, while others involve consensus building. Tell us about a situation where you were decisive and how it worked out for you. And please tell us about a time when you were not decisive enough and what you learned from that. Good question. So um, I'll start with the decisive part. I, um, my first year in Portsmouth, I was um, the assistant who hired as assistant superintendent. And right about this time that year, the high school principal and assistant principal uh, left, um, were, were no longer with us. And, um, and the superintendent put me in as the high school principal. I know I've said this in, in other interviews, but, um, but that was the best experience I could have had as my first uh, year in Portsmouth, just to get to know that high school, the hub of the district, and the depths that I did, the people, the programs, et cetera. But the thing that, um, that was necessary at the time, and uh, in a school that actually, without getting into the, the gory details, was in a bit of turmoil, and the culture was really um, struggling, uh, was to come in and, and sort of um, be able to make some decisions quickly that, um, that sort of helped put to bed some of the divisiveness that, um, that was, in, was there at the time. So um, there were um, a few longstanding issues um, that, were, um, that were causing continual unrest and to be able to come in and to be able to be decisive about scheduling or, um, or discipline school newspaper, this seems like a little example, but we had a school newspaper that was fledgling and, and the, uh, the advisor uh, had stepped away and did not want to do it anymore, so, um, so parents wanted to step in and, and keep the newspaper running, but that led to its own host of issues, uh, again, um, just because of the particular situation that it was. Um, and to be able to come in where there was a lot of literal infighting in the faculty and be able to say, okay, here's, you know, here's how we'll move forward with this. Um, I think for a lot of people, um, the feedback I received anyway was that they appreciated somebody coming in and being decisive about things like that. Um, in, 
indecisive, I, um, uh, well, first of all, taking a step back around the premise of the question, I think there are situations uh, where you really do need to be decisive, and certainly when it comes to health and safety issues and other things, we need to make sure that we're um, being decisive and always uh, focusing in on the, the safety of students and staff. Um, but by nature, I'm a, I'm a collaborator and I'm a consensus builder, and so my default typically is to make sure we're being inclusive um, about decisions that we're making, uh, whether they be about curriculum programs or professional development or whatever it might be. Um, anytime our decisions are gonna affect the classroom, I feel like we need to be involving teachers in those decisions, and that can oftentimes be a, a process that certainly takes, takes a bit of time. Um, but rather than have um, all decisions appear, you know, quote unquote, top down, I believe in a, in a collab more collaborative uh, approach to many of those kinds of uh, decisions. Um, I would say, um, honestly, the, um, the example I'll choose for not decisive enough would have to be recent, would have to be with the opening of school. Uh, and just everything that we were going through uh, in terms of what model can work, how can we make it work, what's our staffing set up. Um, we did um, multiple surveys of staff and of parents to try to get feedback. And uh, I, you know, I believe that's always um, you know, important information and important to get. And the, the challenge sometimes in that is that your feedback itself can be conflicting. And so um, sometimes if you drag that on too long, it becomes, okay, let's make a decision and let's move forward. So, um, so that's one thing that um, as we uh, went into opening school, um, we shifted our phases um, fairly late in the summer uh, to open in a different phase and certainly got uh, a bit of pushback for that. Um, and again, just in hindsight, I think having that kind of decision laid out earlier would have Thanks for being here tonight. We really appreciate it, especially at the time. Sure. Uh, what actions have you taken as a leader to ensure that all students make effective progress in your district? What were the outcomes? And as you plan to close the achievement gap and help students all, excuse me, and help all students reach the highest possible goals in Reading, how will you think about the social and emotional well-being of the students? So um, yeah, I so this is this is a big big focus for us. I know, um, and and I, from what I've seen also here in terms of setting some goals and, and monitoring some progress. Um, first and foremost, I believe that um, if we're going to monitor student learning uh, and progress for it, it has to happen at the classroom and teacher team level. So. We can set broad district goals and school goals, and I think those are important, but they also need to feed up from teacher uh, team goals for student progress informed by where students are at the ended last year, at the beginning of this year, where we hope them to be, how are we gonna monitor their progress as they go. And so we use uh, SMART goals uh, with each of our teacher teams, uh, ask them to set those goals uh, at the beginning of the year and monitor their progress towards them. They get to choose the, the marks of those goals um, and the measures often, uh, but they all uh, need to be focused at least in the areas of literacy and math. And so looking at um, how you build the structure to help students achieve has a lot to do with how you respond to the data you get. And so as we uh, take, um, take assessments and look at where students are, uh, we need to be able to respond to that, and that's where we've done a lot of work to build um, supports and intervention, uh, extra time for students in some cases, intervention blocks, uh, and, and really be able to uh, meet the needs of individual students, both who need some remediation uh, about something or who need enrichment. And so how do we, as a, as a team, shift the model from you know one teacher, one classroom to team of teachers, grade level of students or team of teachers subject area. And so uh, that's been a, a, a huge focus for us. Uh, and then, um, you know, and then celebrating the success. I, I think we don't do that enough in, in schools generally. And uh, oftentimes we'll collect a lot of data but not know what to do with it. And so we wanna make sure that we're following uh, progress of students, not just for the sake of intervening and enriching 
enriching students, but also to know the effectiveness of the strategies we're putting into place and how do we uh, look at those things, how do we share best practices. Uh, we have three K-5 elementary schools, you have five, and you know, I do think there's a lot to be learned from cross-pollination too of what might be happening at a third grade team over here that could be transferred to another team over there. Uh, and so building out those kinds of successes as a district, I think, can, can be contagious as well. Um, and I do think um, it's not an either or when it comes to the social emotional well-being of students. I, I really believe that um, what we need to do is focus on the whole child, the whole student. Um, and I don't want to digress too much, but um, in my doctoral work, my dissertation was on a, a case study of schools going from good to great or great to excellent. And, uh, you know, doing a lot of research into some of the theory around that, what are the leadership levers that move a school in different levels of progression? Um, and long story short, um, what I found is that um, while this school certainly spent the first initial focus on just real straight academics, test prep, this and that, um, what they found is that that only carried them so far. And then they started to engage in work about what else, what other qualities do we value in students? And that led them into work around portrait of a graduate or vision of a graduate, which I know you're doing here as well. And uh, what they found was there was a more, much more robust story to be told about what they value in students. And I remember the principal saying, yeah, but we worried at that time because we were going to take our eye off of the test. And what they found was they actually kept going up um, as they broadened what they were looking for with students. Uh, and this uh, was a school who outpaced the, you know, the, the trends of schools like them. And so we were looking for a, a unique um, sort of positive deviant case. And then um, what was most striking was um, the principal telling the story of how uh, after they had achieved this, some really impressive success over a number of years of improvement, that, um, that the district decided to co relocate um, a special education program to their building um, across multiple schools. <clears throat> and I remember the principal telling the story how uh, he actually got a negative feedback from staff saying, um, you know, we're worried about bringing that whole program over here. We're going to lower our scores. And, uh, and the, probably the most impressive ending to the tale was his response was, you know, this is a culture, this is a community, and we need to make sure we're involving all students in that community. Uh, and they wrapped around that, and they, they kept moving. And, and sure enough, you know, after that, their scores continued to go up. So I, I, I do think there's, there's a lot to be said for uh, really strategic focus on student improvement, but also making sure we're paying attention to the broader aspects of community, uh, of social emotional well-being. Um, you know, so many things affect the academic progress of students, you know, their social emotional health their involvement in extracurriculars, their, um, you know, their overall connection with adults, um, that we can't try to create too narrow of a focus on just how do we deal with the academics. Thank you. Uh, Aaron. Hi, Steve. Thank you so much for being here with us sure. tonight. Um, Please give me a couple examples of how you fostered growth and developed leadership capacity in your staff. Sure, uh, thanks. Um, so, you know, leader, developing leadership capacity and, you know, what we might call talent development, I think is probably the most critical role of a school leader. Um, because at the end of the day, it, you know, the success lies in the individual classroom, the teachers, students, and, and staff. And so how we will look at developing um, those capacities is critical, and I think of it two ways. One is the individual teacher, and how do we help the individual teacher grow um, in their practice? And also collectively, how do we continue to grow as a team and become more effective in our collaboration? So a couple of things I've done um, as assistant superintendent, I put a program into place for shifting what was teachers going off individually to coursework and whatnot to really trying to develop a robust in-house um, course offering. The advantage to that was, um, number one, so I, I would myself teach a lot of the courses with teachers, and that, that's something I get a lot of, um, uh, quite honestly, uh, a lot of my own learning out of, but also um, sort of what feeds me the most uh, in working with people. 
people working with teachers. And, and secondly, those courses could be offered on not only on identified um, needs in the classroom, like differentiated instruction or performance-based assessment, but they could also be focused on district-wide initiatives. So we ran a course around how do we develop equity and opportunity in the classroom? How do we um, you know, look at some of the, the, um, the special education and universal design principles, et cetera? So we've done um, a lot of strategic coursework that have brought teachers in the district together to learn together. Uh, and what we did is we attached our own sort of graduate credit. We're not obviously an accredited institution, but those, those credits would count for teachers towards their salary increments. And so uh, it had the dual purpose of giving them some advancement, but also um, sort of keeping a focus on the professional development collectively. Um, and it was also, honestly, a retention strategy. They can't go to the neighboring district and say, I got 15 credits when we don't have a transcript to give them. So, um, so you know, it is something that helps keep uh, teachers in, in district as well. But, you know, I think that's um, f fostering that growth. Um, our uh, professional learning community work is the same thing. Um, one thing I would mention here is uh, we do a lot of work in terms of um, growth of teachers towards leadership roles. So those courses I was just mentioning, we also continue to try to empower teachers to teach those courses to each other. Uh, we've empowered teachers to run a lot of our professional development. Uh, and we've worked as an administrative team in our own collaborative structure, we call it administrative PLC, uh, and set our own goals. We want to model the same things for teachers that we expect teachers to be doing with each other. And so we've established goals. Um, one recent goal was to um, attack chronic absenteeism in the district and looking at uh, what we called our top 20, and that was the top 20% of students who were most chronically absent. When we looked at that list, we found that that was disproportionate to students of uh, lower socioeconomic status or some other issues that seemed to cut across uh, and, and be parallel with our equity work. Um, but it was a wonderful goal to have a, with, for a K-12 administrative team right, because we have families where students are in elementary, middle, and high school, and if we're all trying to attack this separately and individually, we may be missing an opportunity to create um, a collaborative approach around families. And we also know that absenteeism issues start early on, and then they tend to travel with students and sometimes get, you know, more and more acute. And so um, collectively, putting a real focus on that, letting the data drive our decisions and see our effect uh, was a really positive way to build our own collective capacity uh, for leadership. Um, and so, you know, those would be a couple of uh, examples. But I would say a, a key, and this gets back to the, um, the research I've done around the uh, good to great, great to excellent, which would suggest uh, that if you want to move a school district from really bad to okay, or even from okay to good, you know, your best lever is probably a pretty direct, top-down approach. Hey, we got to do this. We got to get this into order. This is how we got to do it. If you want to move a district from good to great or great to excellent, it's much more about empowering quality staff and making sure that we have a collective and building social capital, building our ability to collaborate. Those are the levers that move a district through innovation and innovative strategies to get better and better. Zadrovec, thank you for being here. I, sure. I knew I was going to mess it up the first no, time perfect. I tried. Um, I'll preface question five by, by acknowledging it's really two questions, so don't let that throw you. So uh, the first piece is, how would you hold educators at all levels accountable for delivering effective instruction? And could you please share some examples of what steps or actions you would take to foster a strong partnership between special education and general education educators? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, so, so looking at, as I said, you know, where, uh, what teachers are doing in the classroom essentially is, you know, the heartbeat of our success with students. So uh, holding, uh, developing talent and holding folks accountable is critical. Um, right now as an administrative team, we're taking another look at our teacher evaluation system uh, because, you know, we want to make sure that we are also, um, that's our current focus, our admin PLC is on how do we, um, continue to give feedback to teachers and continue to make sure teachers are growing. Um, so that, that to me is a, is a critical piece uh, to the puzzle. I also would probably uh, want to mention that, um, you know,
teachers, you know, as we look at a whole staff, we have a whole spectrum of performance, right? So we have certainly, you know, we, we're trying to empower and innovate and, and excel our teachers, and many of them are growing into their own leadership. Um, and we also have teachers who sometimes struggle. And so how do we make sure that we're addressing those issues um, has a lot to do with, um, well, in my practice as superintendent working with the building principals around specific situations that we know we want to make sure that we, um, we find the right supports for teachers and that we make sure that we're holding them accountable to some progress. So our system would have that kind of tiered approach um, to um, situations where we want to see improvement in instruction. Uh, and lastly, having a good working relationship with, with the teachers' union. I mean, I, I would say one of the other things that um, has been a, a hallmark of, of my time as superintendent is to be able to work with the teachers' union around teacher performance. And, uh, and uh, you know, everybody uh, wants to have high-quality instruction. That's Nobody's fighting against that. And, and so we just want to make sure we're as proactive uh, on that. People certainly uh, want to see us um, making sure we have the right supports in place for teachers. And then um, when those are there, um, I find that people are all on the same page if, if teachers are unable to meet those targets that, that we're, we're in agreement on that. Um, so the, in fostering a strong relationship with special education and, and general education, I think starts with your general philosophy of, of special education, that it's a strong, inclusive approach, uh, that you have students um, fully accessing um, regular instruction in there, that you, you're utilizing as much of a push-in kind of model with services that you can, uh, and making sure that students are supported to, um, to find success uh, in, their, in their classroom with the right supports in place. And sometimes that means making sure that uh, there's time for that collaboration between special educators and, and regular educators, uh, that we're sharing those strategies, that our professional development for all educators has to do with some of the uh, universal design principles or on certain strategies that we find effective with, with all students um, and making sure that, um, that there is really strong communication, strong communication between special ed and regular ed, between parents and both of those, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, really looking at how do we, um, how do we work as a team, again, uh, towards the benefit of students. I will, I will pause to note that one of the students uh, I spoke with from Reading uh, self-disclosed that he was on an IEP for much of his schooling and just spoke so highly of the supports that he got that he didn't feel uh, like anything was out of reach, honestly, for what he could do. And so I think that's testament to, mm -hmm. to some of the programs you have in place, too. Okay. Uh, Steve, uh, in the event a school committee member crosses over into the area of operations or curriculum choices of the schools, how would you maintain the boundaries and, and secure that the work and decisions are made by the appropriate members of the leadership team and our educators? Uh, just an honest conversation, Chuck, honestly, first and foremost. Um, uh, you know, everybody that I've met, <laughs> mostly in education, is very well intended for what, what they want to do, how they want to help. Um, I would certainly be able to tell you of school board members I've had in my time where this has been a conversation and and it's really been more about okay you know making sure that we're paying attention to the interest of, of that school committee member and that we're communicating you know that we're communicating about what are the strategies we're putting into place etc um, and I find um, that generally people understand you know what those role differentials are it just has to grow into that trusting relationship, I feel like. And that's where, uh, again, in, in my time working with people, whether they be school board members or administrators, teachers, whomever, parents, um, it, it really has to start with building a trusting relationship and having open and honest communication. Um, and if people know you're coming from a place of trust and respect, I find that they're very receptive to you know, how we can best work together to make sure we're, we're doing the best thing for kids. Aaron? What culture would you create and what guidance would you give about teaching equity and social justice? In a time where the need for this work is sometimes a point of disagreement, in your role as superintendent, how would you lead this work? Uh, thanks, Aaron. So as I said, this has been a, a real passion of mine and, and a real body of work that we've been doing in Portsmouth. Um, and so uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, 
first and foremost, I, I do believe it starts with the, with the role of the, the school committee and the superintendent. Um, we in Portsmouth passed a couple of years ago an equity and excellence in education policy. Um, and one of the things that did for us be, was to really sort of set our values out there um, and make sure that they're transparent, make sure they're visible, and make sure we're communicating them. Because if we don't do that, we can quickly fall into disagreements, I think, over what's, what, what direction are we heading in. Uh, and also stating the importance of this work. I think, um, you know, and again, I, I don't know the ins and outs of, of, of the issues um, of disagreement, but, you know, I, I do believe we have to come from, to this from a place of knowing uh, that, you know, we're a community. So if, if, if one member of the community doesn't feel included or, or for whatever reason doesn't feel supported, we need to be attentive to that. Um, and I think it's, it's a topic and it's, a, it's an issue that really needs a collaborative community approach. Um, I, I think being proactive around these topics is much better than being reactive. And so one of the things that we've done in Portsmouth is we've uh, partnered with some of our local entities. Um, we have a group in Portsmouth called Portsmouth Listens, and they facilitate a process of community dialogue called study circles. And what they've done for different topics in the city is they've created the opportunity for citizens to come and to engage in dialogue, whether it be the redevelopment of this building downtown or at one point the uh, relocation possibly of our middle school, and just to try to engage a real community involvement in the topic. Um, very structured, small group discussion, facilitated with an educational component so that people can learn something when they come. And so uh, last year, um, we partnered with them to run uh, study circles around race and equity in Portsmouth. And uh, these study circles often have a component of student involvement as well. So there's a student uh, study circle component of it. Uh, and what we find is bringing in um, many of our leaders in the community and, uh, and inviting as many people from the community into them, we can create a, a safe space to really dive into um, you know, conversations that, um, that are best had when we can structure them, honestly. And so um, there's been a lot of support to do that and, uh, and work through them. And then um, one of the things that, uh, that is probably most exciting to me in the last year or two is really how we've seen students take a leadership role in this topic. And so um, seeing students engage with each other, seeing students want to engage with adults, um, I think is probably the most powerful aspect of this work. And um, so in addition to trying to build a lot of community engagement, uh, we had a, a student group called We Speak and, uh, and really came out of a place of students who, uh, who previously hadn't really felt they had a voice uh, in, our, in our schools. And, and I don't think, we, I think we were a bit blind to that, to be honest with you. Um, I remember one girl in the group from India told the story of her uh, experience in elementary school where she had uh, brought in a lunch um, that, was, uh, that was more um, specific to, to the food she would eat in India. And a, a student in school basically gave a, a, a face and said, ooh, that smells bad, or something, some, some kind of comment, some kind of microaggression. And, and essentially, years later, now she, as a high schooler, she's telling the story how she never brought food again into school because of how that affected her. So if we can't be in touch with those pieces of how it affects kids and how it affects members of our community, I don't think we're paying enough attention to the issue. And so um, really empowering students. Now, fast forward, that student's been a major part of our group and has really uh, taken a leadership role to the point where they're doing independent projects on how do you identify implicit bias in curriculum materials to professional development for teachers. Uh, over the last few weeks, they've actually held uh, discussions with our teachers at all levels, elementary school, middle school, and high school around um, race, social justice, and implicit bias. And, uh, it's just been tremendous um, because um, we have brought in others. I mean, we have worked with um, the Social Justice Institute out of UNH and other places, and, and there's a place for that work. But I'll tell you, there isn't anything much more powerful to teachers than hearing directly from students and talking to students about the issues that matter. So um, I think it's, it's tremendously uh, important, and, uh, and I do think um, even in times where 
discussions can be kind of divisive, there are ways to come back and approach them in a way that builds community. Thank you. Carl? At the time you begin your tenure in the Reading Public School District, the country and community will have likely emerged or will have begun emerging from the COVID-19 crisis. Could you please talk about how you will re-engage staff, students, and the community to a sense of normalcy going forward? How will you build the trust and previous confidence in the Reading Public Schools? Yeah, thanks, Carla. Um, th these have been trying times. I, 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 you know, there isn't any two ways about it. I think anybody in your seat or mine has probably seen the most difficult 10 months of their time in, in roles like this. So. Um, so how we help build a community uh, you know, through those times is, is critical. And, and, and first and foremost, as a, as a lens backwards, um, as I said, one of my key uh, values is collaboration, approaching relationships, building trusting relationships. Those are great in good times to help you empower people and help you move good to great, great to excellent. They are absolutely critical in times of crisis because um, when it really becomes difficult and can be very, very stressful on everybody, you have to find ways to uh, lean on the relationships you have with people. Um, and, and I mean that uh, literally with you know, uh, district staff, is really building a culture that we can get through this. Um, but having looked at where we've been through, we're all in a mode of how do we get back to, um, to levels of call it normalcy or whatever you will, but, but being able to make sure we're, we're healthy and well coming back as we've been navigating the pandemic. So this is a conversation for our school board right now, actually, is, is how are we planning for next fall at this point? How are we looking towards that? And I do think there is a, a, a large component of this that does include, you know, again, that social emotional wellness, that connection with students. Um, and also, you know, taking stock of what we've learned the last 10 months. I mean, honestly, if you asked me a year ago today what a MERV 13 filter was, I would have told you it was some kind of new coffee technology, you know? And, and yet we've, we've learned so much through the experience of this pandemic. Uh, we've learned about teacher professional development. I mean, it, we, we would go through years and years of the one-off workshops for technology tools that you could give teachers. They do it two or three times a year and it never sinks in, never quite gets hold for many of them. Uh, in the last 10 months, every teacher in your district and mine, I'm sure, has become quite proficient in the use of technology. And it really is, you know, how do you take lessons from that and say, how does that help us as a system think differently about teacher learning, about student learning, et cetera? I think we'll find more flexibility with, with students. You know, we, we do have certain tools that we've found work very well in certain situations, and we'd want to lean on them, too. Um, and then it's, it's really about um, building a community, building, building wellness. I, I, you know, even in these hybrid places that we are right now, it feels disjointed. It doesn't feel whole. And so uh, there's great benefit to it. We, you know, we still hear how happy people are. We just last week started to get students in more at, at all levels. And how happy people are to be in school four days a week. And it's, it's really... Um, but it's still not, you're still in the mask, you're still in a different awkward place. And so as we, as we go through this, I do feel like there's going to need to be some uh, re-engaging with each other around community building. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's something that's, that's on our mind now. It's not something we're saying we have to wait for necessarily. Um, we're trying to right now put as many social emotional wellness strategies into place for students, give students opportunities to connect with each other. Uh, even through these times, um, even when they were remote completely. Um, and we know that a big focus for us and a big focus for teachers is on really making sure students are well and feel well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's true that this has had an effect on so many people uh, that we need to make sure that we're, um, we're attentive to that and making sure that we're, um, we're bringing people back in, in in a way that's healthy and, and whole. And I have to say that, you know, one of the pieces that we just have to keep in the front of us is, is staff, is I think, you know, when I look at the impact this has had on staff, um, you know, again, I know your teachers like mine, are, are, they're just working constantly in, in multiple different facets, 
shifting from different strategies and different modes. And, uh, and as I said to start, my wife is a teacher, so I kind of get this at home too. But it's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's tremendous. And how do we make sure that we're paying attention to um, the overall wellness and, and, and health of staff? Because that's going to have a direct effect and benefit back to students. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, describe, describe your budget experience in both good financial times and difficult financial times. Also, what is your, your vision of how an ideal budget process works? And additionally, Full Day Kindergarten is a fee-based program in Reading with 90% participation, 90 plus percent participation. Explain how you would convert this to a tuition-free program for all with an understanding that you will need to compensate for a one million plus budget shortfall. It's hard to find a million dollars laying around, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this I think is is um, is interesting because we we are having a very similar conversation in Portsmouth with preschool right now. We have full day kindergarten. We were able to put that in, um, you know, twelve or so years ago. Um, but what we found is we have in Portsmouth uh, so many different private options for preschool that. 90-ish percent of parents are paying and finding a place for preschool for their child, and yet we have a good number of students, uh, but again, particularly from more impoverished backgrounds, that are coming with no preschool experience at all. And so our work um, in the last few years had been to um, create a liaison position that would help work with families, kind of like a case manager almost, to connect them with opportunities of preschool, and that, that was both preschool in the community where we may have a, a, a partner preschool that would open up a slot or two for students. Our own preschool programs, which we have one of at the high school as part of our career technical education program, as well as our uh, early identified program, which is an inclusive program at one of our elementary schools, like your RISE program here. And, um, and just trying to build out additional opportunities to make sure that everybody has access to early early learning because you know taking a step back to the premise of the question it is absolutely critical we have quality early learning for all students uh, and again I would dial it back to preschool and, and try to make sure that we have that um, but not pay for universal preschool in that case and so that was where we were trying to find the way to fill the need that existed not replace the programs that had already been in place um, and so, and that's been tremendously successful for us. We partnered with the Housing Authority to actually build an additional satellite preschool uh, at one of the, the housing developments and, and really serviced a number of students who would otherwise never have been in a preschool program. But the kindergarten uh, with 90% participation is, is a similar kind of dilemma, which is that, you know, you might look at that and say, well, what's the real problem if the vast majority of people are getting kindergarten right now? Um, I would uh, certainly look at that from a lens of equity as well, and I'm sure there are things in place to help support needy families for that, or at least I assume there are. Um, but it's wherever you draw that line, there's going to be somebody right on the other side of it, right? So uh, I do think there's an inherent issue with if kindergarten is tuition-based, and I think it's an important goal to have. Um, the key budgetarily in this is to make sure that we're having a, a strategy that may have to span over a few years, maybe it's a three-year um, uh, you know, effort or whatever it might be, and it probably would have to, to become that priority. And, and sometimes that, that is what it takes in budgeting, is to say, here's the priority we're going to focus in on and not focus in on certain other priorities that might be up there. And those, those are the tough decisions when you say good times and bad. I've known mostly the difficult financial times uh, with, uh, with budgeting generally. And I, I think it's always about prioritization, communication, um, you know, and, and making sure you're responsible to the taxpayer too. Um, I do believe um, that has to be uh, a constant message to what we're doing for efficiency, what we're doing for responsibility. Uh, and so in our budget messages to our community, that's always a, a piece that we're emphasizing is, is what is, number one, the value we're getting, but number two, how are we managing the public dollars in a way that's responsible. And you build public trust over that, and then certain asks that you may have as you go certainly don't become simple or easy, but certainly become much more um, stronger and 
so you know looking at how we would we would look at uh, funding you know I would wonder about some kind of incremental approach to reducing fees and in, in increasing budget support or something like that that might uh, have a trajectory over time where you could even in theory pause that for a year if you had to at the levels you were able to get to and then continue on um, so that you're eating away at that million dollars over perhaps what might have to be a few years um, but I, again I, I do think it comes back to some of the messaging around the value of full day kindergarten and why that is so important to us thank you so right now we're at the halfway point so you're doing great okay uh, so uh, I just wanted to make you aware of that uh, John Nice one sentence one for you this time. Okay. Please discuss your process of goal setting, implementation, and monitoring. Yeah, so on a few levels, I would start with, um, with the work I have done with the school board around district-wide goal setting. Uh, I do think that is a critical piece to the role of a superintendent, is making sure that there is a narrative around our district goals. And so working collaboratively with the school board, we've had goals that have focused on equity, have focused on expanding opportunity for all students. That might be early college courses or internships, et cetera. Uh, a goal focused around community and communication with community. And a goal focused around student wellness most recently. And so um, the, the key in those goals, as I'm sure you're familiar with SMART goals, is that we do have goals that are measurable, that we can monitor our progress towards them that are realistic, that we can, we can say, you know, if we work together, we can achieve this. And so in the case of, uh, of our equity goal, uh, I actually drafted and created an equity opportunity index, uh, as we've called it, and it's a variety of measures uh, around issues of equity and opportunity to see where our gaps are. And that might span from, uh, as I mentioned earlier, attendance at the elementary level to enrollment in world language at the middle school level, to uh, uh, GPA differentials, for example, between students on free and reduced lunch and students not on free and reduced lunch at the high school, as well as enrollment into advanced coursework and where are we seeing students represented in our most rigorous course of studies. And so all of that sort of got uh, put together, not to bore you with the details, into an index that came out with a number that represented the gap between uh, students, for example, on free and reduced lunch and students not on free and reduced lunch. And in all of those collective measures across the whole district, we're able to measure our progress um, in closing that gap. And so um, I, I will pause to say COVID certainly put a little uh, wrinkle into some of our data gathering because attendance meant something different all of a sudden. But, uh, but still, it's important to set goals that you can measure, I think, and, and see your way through. And not everything um, can be quantified, but you can take a, a, at least a quality, um, you know, quantitative or qualitative measurement into something. Uh, implementation, uh, to me, is, is about uh, building consensus uh, and building community involvement in many cases. So again, for the example of goal of communication, I had set a goal for myself that uh, at the end of the year, 90% uh, of the parents would respond on a survey that they felt uh, knowledgeable about our school and district goals, that they felt engaged about them, and that they supported them. Uh, and so, um, again, turning that into something that I could actually take a measurement of and see where parents stood on that uh, did allow me, at the end of the year, to, to put a survey out and ask not just, you know, um, what, have, what have you heard, but, but what methods of communication are landing for you? Uh, what are the messages you're getting? Do you, um, do these goals resonate with you? Uh, do you support them? Do you feel engaged with them? Just a variety of questions about that. I didn't reach the 90% goal, but I did get a tremendous amount of great feedback uh, to how we can structure communication, tweak some things here or there, and make sure we're engaging the community. Um, we've had opportunity with, um, I, I do uh, coffee and conversation nights with parents, you know, invite them in for topics in the schools. We've done parent advisory groups. Um, we've tried to uh, make sure we're engaging parents in, in a lot of our, our work around these goals. Because if we do, then you know when, when other decisions come up, whether they be budgetary or, or whatever, there's a little more uh, collective knowledge and, and sort of buy-in, in a sense, to what we're trying to do. And so again, that leads into the monitoring of them. You know, if, if we can structure them, that we can sort of take a, a measure of where we are along them, we can monitor our, our 
progress. Um, but then stepping it back from the district level, I think goals are absolutely critical at the building level and as I said before, at the teacher team level. Uh, I think you know we have to develop a culture that um, that has people reflecting uh, against um, you know evidence of, of towards a goal. And so um, you know, and again, that doesn't always have to mean test scores or something. That could mean other qualitative measures with kids and, and sort of getting a sense for, for where they are. It could be student surveys, student reflections, um, a number of different measures uh, that might help us understand where we are against uh, our goals. Um, and so you know, I, I think it's absolutely uh, critical that we, we set those goals and that we monitor our progress um, towards them and that they're coherent, I guess is the last thing I'll say, is that those goals need to have a coherence to them. Um, so that as a district, we are all focusing in and sort of rowing in the same direction, for lack of a better term. Thank you. Sean? Please talk about your views on school safety and the various drills that have been established by state and national leaders. Do you think that there is sufficient evidence to support these drills across all levels? Uh, yeah, great question. Obviously, you know, not to digress, but it's, it's interesting how um, in our times in COVID, you know, not to say it's fallen off a bit, but it's, it's certainly all of a sudden, um, you know, we don't have students in school as much anymore. When we have students in school, we don't tend to see as much discipline, quite honestly, um, at least we haven't uh, in these times. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't say we've, we've put it on the back burner by any means, but it certainly uh, is something that, um, that we have to keep foremost in our mind and you know for example when we had the fall opening we said we're going to use every inch we have to get kids spread out and, and so we we rented tents we did everything else made sure kids are outside as much as possible which is great but we also have to revisit our safety protocols to make sure that if anything happens we know what the protocol is when everybody's scattered about in tents all over the the field and so uh, you know in any time those things those things are important um, but I would say uh, we have a wonderful relationship with our uh, police department and our SROs in the schools, and they help us and collaborate with us on many of these safety uh, drills and protocols. Uh, like you, I'm sure, we've uh, moved through drills of lockdowns. We've moved through drills um, in terms of uh, active shooter drills and, and everything else, and just making sure that, um, that we have the support there for teachers and that we're reaching students in them. Um, and as I've, I'm reading into the question a little bit, I might, I might suspect that something like an ALICE protocol might be a question mark for, say, an elementary classroom or where, where developmentally appropriate is, are some of those drills. And, and those are the same conversations we've had um, to, um, to not ignore them, uh, in fact, to find ways to um, create a very, very safe spot for kids um, to take down the, the tension of the drill considerably um, and to actually run teachers and students through um, very, um, I don't want to say watered down, it's not the right word, but, but certainly not as scary, for lack of a better term, drill than you might imagine if you're going to say active shooter drill with a kindergarten class. So um, what, we're, what we're doing is making sure people are prepared and making sure people understand all of the aspects of our safety plans. Um, but also um, what we found in that is that we have a lot of tension and anxiety in people before the drill. It really ramps up. And then after the drill, it really, in every case we've had, has really lowered completely because people have, have, sent, have actually felt a sense of, of calm because, OK, we, we went through that. It wasn't so bad as a drill, and, and you know, I feel like we've at least practiced that. Um, so I do think that you know, in different ways, we do things with, with all levels, but, um, but certainly it's, it's adjusted a bit. Um, our high schoolers are, um, again, uh, credit to them. Obviously, this is a, a critical, important issue for everybody. After Parkland, you know, we went through similar kinds of things about how, how do we engage students also in those drills, and they came up with some ideas uh, in our high school that we weren't even thinking about um, in terms of safety protocols. So I do, I do think it's a reality we can't avoid um, and, and be prepared, but just take it as a straightforward uh, approach. Um, in 
and so and so people feel like um, like we we have thought through anything that may may occur, um, and you know and again I think a lot of it has to do with building out the community. We've done um, a lot of work around threat assessment teams in the schools, uh, and you know I think you have to deal as proactively as possible. We had one team meet uh, at the middle school this week uh, for a threat, and I I, I feel like. The more uh, proactive we can be and, and the more responsive we can be uh, around issues and make sure that we're um, collaborating on them, uh, again, the, the, more, the more we can, we can make sure we're building the, essentially the right culture um, to support uh, through those things. And, and that's where we've seen our greatest success, honestly. I think everybody feels like safety is number one and we're working together on it. Thank you. Carla? Tell us about any experience that you may have in schools construction or renovation. Sure. Um, yeah, we've done some extensive uh, construction and renovation uh, over the last decade, certainly. When I got to Portsmouth, it was right at the end of the major high school renovation project, uh, which really redid our, our whole entire high school. Um, and then as assistant superintendent and superintendent, I saw through the middle school renovation project and a renovation project at each of our three elementary schools. Um, I would say, um, you know, those, in addition to really being transformative for the school building, uh, it, it also has a great story for us anyway around energy and efficiency. Um, and, and certainly, um, obviously, these things always cost a lot of capital to begin with, but what we've been able to show is some really impressive um, vast reductions in energy usage. Mm -hmm. And so um, the savings that we've seen over the last five years, uh, you know, certainly a factor into the hundreds of thousands of dollars around those things. And so I do think there's a, an important message to the community too, which is these renovations are purposeful uh, and they are, do have some long-term benefits. Um, and then, you know, obviously in the, in the broader scheme of things, um, funding for these things and bonding for these things is an important consideration. Um, I'm not sure how much you know about New Hampshire bonding, but we used to have building aid in the state. Our middle school was one of the last projects that qualified for it, and then that had, had went away. And so for the last now 10 years or so, you know, the full cost of construction has been borne by the communities in which those uh, building projects occur. And so. You know, I think leveraging where I know Massachusetts is a little different, but leveraging where we can, uh, you know, support and in addition from the state. I know there's a different kind of rotation cycle and, and whatnot, and just being familiar with when the right time is and, and how to position those things, I think, is important. Um, but I do know, um, you know, just in terms of uh, back to the kindergarten question, I know that has come up too, is that what's the space if we were at 100% capacity? Do we have the space and what do we do? And those are also a part of the long term. So uh, the final question is uh, the one that Dorothy uh, Pressure sent you in advance, and Tom is going to read the question. And we are right at 59 minutes, so you're doing yeah. great. Okay, I've got time. I could take a half hour with this. <laughs> if you so choose. Um, but you also have closed after this, and any additional questions the committee may have. Sure. Um, so here's a scenario, which you've read, but for the public. Um, parent of an eighth grader objects to the teaching technique of their student's math teacher who provides a weekend problem of the week over the year to be solved by Monday. However, if no student can solve the problem and explain the method to the class, the teacher refuses to give the answer or a method for finding it. Parents who have been trying to help their children solve the problem note that some kids spend hours of weekend time wrestling with the challenge, often failing. Request by parents to give the answers and method to the students does not receive a response. Things come to the head at a PTO meeting when a parent with a math background points out that some problems pose a challenge for college math majors. Failing to give answers builds esteem problems for students, especially girls who are stereotyped unfairly as not ready for math. The teacher, however, is adamant. The teacher responds that it's my classroom and I do what I want. The principal who hired the teacher explains that it's important for kids to recognize the role of unanswered questions in their lives. The parent escalates to the school committee member and demands that the practice stop. So 
Some of their kids are being turned off to math and feel humiliated by the teacher. The board member calls the superintendent and demands that something be done. Walk through the process that you would use to resolve this situation. All right. Um, <clears throat> so as a, as a, first of all, this hits close to home, this one, because not only as my current role as superintendent, but also as a former middle school math teacher. So, um, But I, I, I will take a little bit of time to talk through the first four bullets, and then I think the last two really deal specifically with my role as superintendent and, and what a, how I would respond here. Um, so just to start, um, you know, with the eighth grade math teacher, you know, I, 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 off, I do wonder if this is a, mis, a, di, uh, a disconnect between intent and results. Uh, so if, uh, for example, the middle school math teacher uh, is intending to build certain qualities in students of grit or perseverance or, or things like that, um, it's, it may not be hitting that desired result, and that's where the disconnect seems to be. In the first instance, um, well, first of all, I'll, I'll talk about policy a couple times through this. In the first instance, I guess, you know, uh, you hear a parent complaining about uh, homework on the weekend, and I would first wonder, you know, do we have a policy that deals at, at all with any of this, and, uh, and does it relate to it at all? Because I think if you have a policy that kind of directs some of the issues that may come up, you have a, a pretty direct line to um, some of the, the answers or, or responses to it. But assuming that there isn't such a policy in this case, um, and probably wouldn't be, I would I would wonder again about that about that disconnect. Uh, so if uh, you know if if no student can solve the problem uh, and and no method is given, again it seems to me, uh, and again based on the principal's comment later on, that um, that the intent of the teacher is is to really challenge students to an extent extensive degree. Uh, I would pause based on the comment from the math person with the math background that if we're asking eighth graders to do AP calculus, we may want to have that conversation that, you know, this is going to be out of reach for everybody. But if, if it's not, if these are problems that are, in the, at least in the teacher's mind, something that students can grapple with and come to some resolution, then, then that disconnect with the parents seems to be around what's the purpose of this problem set. And so I, I would call back, you know, and again, I, I don't know this to be true about your work with vision of a graduate, but I would wonder if, we've are, if we are stating as a district that we value and, and what we want to graduate our students with, again, perseverance, grit, uh, comfort with the unknown, grappling with the unknown, comfort with doubt. If we're, if we're stating those as explicit qualities we want in students, then you might look at this assignment and say, okay, the teacher's trying to build something that's going to help and you know build into those qualities. Um, but what we seem to have in this situation is our parents who are expecting that their students and students who are expecting that their task is to come away with an answer over the course of the weekend. So, um, so again, I, I would take a step back to wonder, is there some other communication that would go to parents around how do you assist your child? Here's what our goal really is in this. How do you assist your child through this process? Where do you uh, offer some encouragement? Where do you offer some signs? And where do you say, look, we've gone as far as we can. You don't have to you know, continue. Um, because perhaps getting the answer isn't always the point, I guess, in this, in this particular example. Um, and so you know, looking at that um, and trying to find, uh, again, assistance you can give parents in that, I think is important. Um, and again, I, I, I'll spend some small degree of time defending this, this intent and then uh, a bit of time questioning some of the red flags I see in this scenario. Um, but in terms of defending that intent, if you were to give the answer key and the step-by-step -step guidance to parents, but your intent was really to have students grapple, I think you'd be working at cross-purposes with what your, your intent is, right? So um, if the intent literally is, I don't want parents to help, with the answer, I want the process to be a little more messy, then that has to be more clearly uh, stated and supported. Um, and so then we, we fast forward to the PTO meeting. Uh, and again, it, it seems like things are, are coming to a bit of a head. Uh, and not to say it would have been appropriate for a PTO meeting, but I think another perhaps missed opportunity in some of this is how do we engage parents in similar kinds of problem solving? Um, <clears throat> I know in my first um, job,
job as assistant superintendent, we were doing a major math revision in the district. And uh, we had parent nights where we actually brought parents in to go through these you know, open-ended problems. What, what, how, what does it mean to really grapple with a problem, not come up with a quick answer? And so we would actually bring parents in and run through those kinds of problems. And I, I, I believe, again, this is my math background, that, that those problems need to be problems that invite students in with many doors and high ceilings. Uh, that is to say, we have to have multiple points of access and then a lot of uh, places students can go uh, in the problem. So, so you know, one example, <clears throat> and again, I don't have any sense of what the problems here are, but one example could be, you know, you got the 1,224 students here at Reading Memorial High School. What if we brought them all on the football field and said every student will shake hands? This is a non-COVID example, I suppose. But every student will shake hands with every other student exactly once. Uh, how many handshakes in total would there be? And so um, in that kind of a problem, you know, unless you're really skilled with some algebra, that might be, oh, how do I even approach that? Uh, and that's where you might get into some support for problem solving strategies. Well, would you solve a simpler problem? Would you draw a picture? How would you make it concrete? All of those things could help give some tools to parents to help with their, with their children on certain uh, problems. Uh, but then moving into uh, the, the role of superintendent, you know, takes me into the, sec the last two bullets. And so if the teacher is adamant and the teacher responds, it's my classroom and I do what I want, uh, it's a bit of a red flag for me, to be honest. Uh, and, uh, and back to the policy conversation, I would wonder if, if, the, if, if the response truly is, it's my classroom, I do what I want, I wonder are there policies that aren't being followed in this particular uh, classroom. But again, I don't want to presume anything um, with the teacher and, and if anything, presume the positive intent of the, of the problem. And so it sounds like the principal is trying to do that, is trying to say, hey, <clears throat> you know what, we're, we're trying to um, let these kids have, have unanswered questions in their lives. How do they grapple with that? Um, the issue I see with this is that you have a teacher who has said, uh, who seems pretty adamant that, uh, you know, I'm not gonna listen to anybody, I'll do what I want. Uh, and that just creates walls, right, not bridges. And so how do we help work with that. In my role as a superintendent, all of a sudden I'm getting a call from one of you and says I've got this irate parent. Um, my first instinct would be, okay, you know, I don't want you to be the go-between in this. Can I talk to the parent and, uh, and have, get more information uh, out of that myself? Um, <clears throat> what I found is, is that, you know, building a reputation of being approachable and being a problem solver does help put parents at ease to reach out to you. But um, but I would say, you know, and one of my first questions to the parent would be, have you had that conversation with the principal? Have you talked to the principal? Because um, it seems like they've talked to the teacher, or at least the teacher's made their position known. Um, and my role as superintendent, honestly, would at that point be to work with the principal to help support um, the situation, uh, essentially to try to bridge what, again, I assume as a mismatch of intent and result, because, um, to me, and, and this is where you know some of the the work and coaching with the principal comes into place too, um, because I would I would think that um, the principal would recognize that this teacher statement uh, doesn't help necessarily bring people into the intent, um, and so how do I work with the principal to work with the teacher around some of that kind of communication, uh, and and some of it is as simple as you know, talking to the teacher and understanding, you know, that the intent is to build uh, perhaps uh, a line of inquiry with students, perseverance, et cetera, perhaps a love of math. Hey, this can be really interesting as I really try to engage in it. And look over here, the results you're getting are the exact opposite of what you're trying to do. And so how do we make that part obvious enough to say, look, something has to change. If, if kids are, you know, are, are pulling their hair out crying, et cetera, we have to be able to respond to that and deal with that. In uh, the last piece, and this is a bit of a red flag to me, is that when it says that some of their kids turned off to math and feel humiliated by the teacher, because humiliated implies willful intent, I think, on the part of teacher. And, and I'm not assuming that that's true, but if that's the way it's coming across, then we're coming across as a teacher who's humiliating students. That certainly probably crosses the line of some policy that we do have. But, uh, but I do think um, we have to be able to work with teachers, on, uh, again, to common ground of what is the intent, how do we how do we do that, and how do we best communicate um, with parents? And 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 again, I, I, I it's it's hard sometimes in these scenarios to know what the scope is, um, and so looking.
looking at, you know, are there successes in what's going on here that we're not seeing right here? And, and, and oftentimes in my conversations with teachers on like issues, you hear a little bit of the other side of the story. And I think that's a part of the conversation as well. And you got to build to a common understanding and, and, uh, and, and again, acknowledge that if, if students are feeling this way, we have to do something about it. Great. Thank you. I have a, uh, another question, Steve. So in making uh, the transition from New Hampshire to Massachusetts, what do you view as uh, the major differences that you'll need to get up to speed on uh, in terms of being a superintendent in Massachusetts versus New Hampshire? Yeah, Chuck, um, I've thought about that because I, I do think, and, then, and let me start by saying that's one of the exciting things in my mind about this possibility is, is I, I would love to learn a new system uh, and that is going to be a learning curve if, if offered and lucky enough to be here um, for me. Uh, and it would be a, an intentional part of an entry plan um, to, uh, to look at a, a phased out plan that would involve uh, a deep dive into some learning. So, um, you know, some things are similar but of different names. We have adequacy aid, you have chapter 70, we have catastrophic aid, special aid aid, you have circuit breaker. You know, some of those things are similar themed pieces that go by different names, but there's intricacies beneath them that are going to be important to understand and learn. Uh, the school construction process in Massachusetts, for example, I really don't know a lot about. So, um, so those are some things that I think are, are absolutely critical. Um, and I'm fortunate to have colleagues in New Hampshire that have been superintendents in Massachusetts. I'm fortunate to, you know, we're fortunate to be neighbors. Um, but I certainly would want to um, to understand, you know, that 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 the first step really is to try to take a deep dive into that. And that also comes with an entry plan that, of course, would involve you know, talking to, to stakeholders here and understanding things. And, and again, I would call back to the site visit I had down here with people, which is that it just seems like it's a tremendous uh, group of people and resource to, to tap into for that kind of a piece. But, but I, I would think the structure um, certainly would be uh, different. The other would be DESE. I, you know, New, uh, New Hampshire Department of Ed is a little more hands off than what I think New, uh, Massachusetts is. Um, but it's uh, but that's an important component, right? So I, I would also want to make sure that I'm uh, I'm getting familiar with some of the, the rules and regulations around that. Um, you know, and other things are universal. Honestly, I mean, again, I see so many similarities of what I've learned of Reading and what I'm dealing with in Portsmouth that some of it is just comfortingly familiar. But um, certainly, there'd be some things to learn. Great, thank you. Any other follow up? On one of your answers to one of the first questions, and you said something about, um, you know, doing surveys and getting feedback from the community about, you know, reopening models and things like that. And you know, we had the experience where I think we had a survey that went out that had three options, and the answers came back almost exactly a third, a third, a third, right? And the net result of that is two thirds of the community feels like whatever you chose wasn't what they were looking for. How did you approach when when you run into situations like that? How do you approach sort of making folks feel like they were heard, making them feel like their their concerns were taken into account, and understand why you ultimately landed on something that you know wasn't what they were looking for? Yeah, um, Sean, my first tongue-in-cheek answer is I, I I like to change plans every week so that at least somebody's happy <laughs> at some point. Um, but uh, but I, I think um, you have to go back to what is the, the basis of rationale for the decisions you're making. So a, a great example in our case was we, we had a, uh, and this is what I referred to earlier, we had a four phase plan we were working on since last April and we had a task force of, across multiple stakeholders and we felt pretty good about it. It was uh, you know everything from uh, phase one, which is what we were in back in March, total remote to uh, phase two, targeted populations in school, to phase three, anybody can come who wants to come, and then we have a remote option, to uh, phase four, full in. And as we uh, got into um, July and then into August, we realized that uh, the, the community numbers, uh, you know, weren't at a place we were comfortable with the social distancing we were going to have to do for phase three, which is what we wanted to open in, and yet we didn't want to dial all the way back to phase two, which left 80 plus percent of the students not walking into school at all. 
So, um, so and this was the, the indecisive piece I had mentioned before, but so we came up with phase 2.5, right? So, uh, so what we did is we had every student in one day a week, uh, and so everybody got to come in either Monday or Tuesday, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, targeted populations came in. It was a lot of lift, and it was certainly, um, you know, something that tried to satisfy multiple needs, and sometimes when you try to satisfy too many needs, of course, you don't end up satisfying any at all. But it, it was, it was, had a lot of positive components to it, to the opening, not just because every student got to see their teacher w at least weekly, uh, but it also had a really positive component to those vulnerable students we were inviting in. And they were, they were students on special services, but they were also students who had other support needs. Uh, we were had, in most cases, between 20 and 30 percent of the students in uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday as well. And what we heard from teachers uh, was that they were getting a chance to get to know these students more than they felt they would have otherwise. And so building a connection with our most vulnerable students for those first few months of school actually turned out to be a huge positive. Um, but, you know, that, that certainly is, is something that, um, you know, again, you, you, we don't satisfy everybody. And so we started to get a lot of pushback from parents that, hey, why is my kid in only one day a week and these kids are in four days a week? And that's why I come back to the narrative. You have to come back and recenter on here's why we're doing this. Here's what here's why our equity work is so important, and here's why we developed this model to try to be true to those values that we had. Because if we simply said everybody gets half, we would have found our most vulnerable kids fall farther and farther behind. Thank you. Anyone else? any final remarks that you'd like to make? Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, I just, I really appreciate being a finalist here. I, I really appreciate your time. Um, I, I certainly would find myself tremendously lucky um, to move forward, but um, but in either case, uh, just really appreciate the, the process here, the depth and the ability to get to know people. Um, I feel like it's been a great process for me. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do think, uh, you know, we're all dealing with similar kinds of uh, issues and challenges, and, uh, and I, I feel like there's just a, a tremendous amount of potential here, and I know you're going you're gonna to be well off regardless of, of what direction you go in, I'm sure, but I um, just really appreciate the time that you've been able to give me. And so we sincerely thank you for uh, uh, applying and coming in and meeting with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Samantha did send it, Gail. Samantha sent it. 